Welcome to the docket presented by Defense Diaries. I am your Sorry, host, say it Bob again. I cut what? you off. Say it again. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Welcome to the docket. I'm your host, Bob Mata. Uh, and this is presented by Defense Diaries. As we uh, are going to be doing our continuing coverage of the Delphi case, uh, I am, of course, joined by my beautiful and brilliant host, Ali Mata. What's up, girl? Hey, babe. Hi, all. How are you? So we're back. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, like, shocked by what you're, you know, about to about to read. What do you mean? Oh, yeah. Well, we'll, we'll get to that. So for anybody out there that is not following the Delphi case, uh, just a short kind of primer on it back in 2017, February 13th, two young girls uh, by the names of Abigail Williams and uh, Liberty German, uh, had off the day of school. It was supposed to be a, a snow day. Uh, turns out they didn't have to use it, so they gave the, uh, they gave the kids off that particular day of school. Um, the girls were brought over to the bridge uh, in a kind of a nature preserve area where they have trails and, and people enjoy going out there and exercising and sightseeing um, and enjoying nature. And they were dropped off there. Um, and they were supposed to be picked up around uh, three o'clock. Uh, they were dropped off around 30, a little bit after that. Um, and uh, and Libby's father was supposed to pick them up. Uh, ultimately, he gets there. Uh, the girls aren't answering the phone. He can't get a hold of them. Uh, he gets out of the car. He searches on the trails and the bridges. Can't find the girls. Uh I wouldn't say at, the, at that exact moment panic ensued, but certainly concern, concern. Uh, as to where the girls are uh, definitely ensued. By about five o'clock after they've exhausted all of their uh, resources in terms of contacts, uh, they realize that at this point they have to get law enforcement involved. Um, they do, in fact, do that. A search ensues um, up until... Uh, Kind of the early evening hours, I'd say eight or nine, uh, they did search throughout the night using uh, heat-seeking drones and things of that nature. But in terms of the fact that it was dark, it became difficult for them to continue any kind of mass search. Uh, the, the search continued first thing the next morning, and unfortunately, the girls were discovered on a uh, adjoining piece of land. Um, and unfortunately, they were deceased case then uh, was investigated for five years. Uh, multiple people were looked at. Uh, none were arrested. And ultimately, uh, in October of 2022, uh, a gentleman by the name of Richard Allen was arrested uh, and charged with both of the homicides of both Libby and Abby. And uh, that is basically where we've uh, been covering this story from that point forward as the procedural process in this case has been an absolute nightmare. Um, and it's, it's been one in Al, you've been practicing for as long as I have, as we graduate from the same law school at the same time, I, I've never seen anything like it ever. No, I haven't um, seen I've anything never... quite like it. And it has brought, you know, many lawyers out of the defense bar to speak up, to get involved, to, you know, to do something. Uh, so it's, it's definitely something that has grabbed the attention of the defense bar as far as, and again, for those who, of you who don't know, primarily because of the court trying to remove Richard Allen's counsel of choice and force him to use specific court appointed or different court appointed lawyers after he had already developed a relationship with the court appointed lawyers that he has now and the manner in which that happened, the lack of due process that was involved again, spurred the lawyers from all over the country, defense bar lawyers and all sorts of lawyers to, to get involved and to speak out. And again, like he said, that's what, that's what's got us here. And just to, to add to what Bob said so far, as far as we know, Richard Allen has no prior criminal record. And I'm just going to say before we get into the motion that 
Bob's about to read to all of us. After he does that, I will lay out the reasons that I feel it's lacking as far as several other legal arguments that could be raised and positions that could be raised that are not evident um, herein. And if you guys recall, Judge Gull can be very strict in the motion to dismiss. She limited the attorneys to the four corners of their writing. That just means to like what the motion said. Um, so it's important to kind of get all your potential, winnable, viable legal issues out, you know, when you file the the motion. And again, after we go through it, we'll tell you what we think should also be included. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, thank you everybody for joining us. And uh, we were initially going to come in with this because there had been uh, filings while we were on vacation. Uh, the state had responded to uh, the defense's request for a third Franks hearing. And then uh, the defense then filed a reply to that. Initially, um, the, the the goal was to go through those documents tonight. However, this document was filed and it made more sense to go through this. We I still plan on, on us going through those two documents. They're interesting um, in terms of, uh, you know, what they state. Uh, and I, I feel that it's probably worth our time to go through them. Um, Allison was looking for somebody that had gone through those documents last night. I, I thought that uh, Teresa may have gone through them, um, but it doesn't look like anybody did. I, I don't know if you looked through all the proper all the proper channels, but uh, I was a little I bit surprised if, to hear that. I don't know that I did either. I was just very taken aback by the defense's reply to the to the state's response, and I was kind of wondering if anyone had covered it. So I, I do think it will be important for us to do. Um, and it, yeah, it sounds we will. Like you don't we anticipate will in, in short order. time today. It, 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 no, it, we it, won't. Okay. No, I, I don't. It, it, they're lengthy. And this, the memo is 11 pages, the, the motion short, but um, I'm sure it's going to, it's going to spur on a lot of conversation. Um, all right. So I'm pulling the document up here. Uh, what was filed today was a, uh, by the defense was a motion to suppress statements. Um, and essentially what they're seeking to do, uh, is they're trying to suppress the confessions or any statements against interest that Richard Allen made while he was, uh, detained in Westville, uh, and most likely any other place. So let, let's get through it. Uh, the motion, as I said, is short. Uh, the memo is lengthy. And we'll go through both. So the motion to suppress statements, defendant Richard M. Allen by counsel Bradley Rosie uh, respectfully requests that this court suppress as evidence in this cause, any and all oral and written communications, confessions, statements, or admissions alleged to have been made by defendant Allen during his pretrial detention in this cause. In support of this motion, defendant Allen states as follows. Paragraph one, defendant Allen is charged with two counts of felony murder, counts one and two. Uh, and two counts of murder, counts three and four. Paragraph two, during the course of defendant Allen's pretrial detention, it is alleged that defendant Allen communicated incriminating statements to state actors and or their agents, all of which the state of Indiana intends to present to a jury at the trial in this cause. Paragraph three, the statements were involuntary and thus uh, obtained in violation of the following. A, the Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution. B, the Sixth Amendment of the United States Constitution, C, the 14th Amendment of the United States Constitution, and D, Article 1, Sections 12, 13, and 14 of the Indiana Constitution. The statements sought to be suppressed were obtained as a result of psychological and mental coercion illegally directed against the defendant, and such statements were, therefore, involuntarily given. Uh, paragraph 5. <clears throat> Excuse me. The statements sought to be suppressed were obtained as a result of physical coercion illegally directed against the defendant, and such were, uh, and such statements were therefore involuntarily given. Therefore, any and all communications, confessions, statements, or admissions alleged to have been offered up by defendant Allen were elicited in violation of his constitutional rights under the Fifth, Sixth, and Fourteenth Amendments to the Constitution of the United States and his rights under Article One, Twelve. 13 and 14 of the Indiana Constitution. Wherefore, 
Defendant Allen, by counsel, respectful, uh, respectfully requests this court, one, conduct a pretrial hearing to determine if the statements alleged to have be, uh, been given were voluntary in nature, and two, uh, to suppress as evidence in this cause any and all communications, confessions, statements, or admissions, written or oral, made by him subsequent to his arrest in this cause. Okay, so right, while you're so pulling that. that up, I'm going to start by saying I, I had not read the motion because, you know, like Bob said, I mean, the motion's very brief and usually everything's sort of in the memorandum. So I'm glad to see that he cited the, the Fifth Amendment, the Sixth Amendment, the 14th and the equivalent state of Indiana constitutions because they're not mentioned in the memorandum. And I, I wasn't sure if he even asserted them. So that was one of the, the glaring things that I was like, hey, what the hell's going on here? Why is that not in here? So I'll just say, based on what you just read, I would have personally called that a motion to suppress and or exclude. And I would have added that there was um, that it was more prejudicial than probative and inherently unreliable and that there's not only indicia of unreliable unreliability, but there's indicia of falsity, uh, which you'll get through when, when everyone hears this. And I would have just argued that based on his mental state, which you'll also see here, that that's why it has very little probative value based on the mental state. And again, the facts that will come out here that show there's information that's incorrect um, and that it's inherently unreliable and, and argued... <clears throat> In addition to everything he argued there, that would have been the only uh, additional argument I, I would have made. And I may have uh, framed the language to match the law a little bit more um, and also include that his um, I, I'm, I'm not sure whether he invoked his right to counsel, but I'm assuming that he that he had and that the then putting state actors there to elicit information interfered with that right. All right. So you ready? Yep. Uh, so typically when you file a motion, sometimes uh, contemporaneously you'll file a memo. Sometimes you'll file, file it after the fact. Uh, it, it appears that Brad Rosie is the one who prepared this. Uh, so he filed his motion and his memo uh, at the same time. So this is a memorandum, a memorandum of law in support of defendant Allen's motion to suppress. Uh, and these are the facts. Defendant Allen was arrested in October of 2022 and immediately detained in the Carroll County Jail. Allen was thereafter transferred to the White County Jail and ultimately charged with two counts of felony murder. The charges were lodged against him on October 28th of 2022. On November 3rd of 2023, the Carroll County Sheriff petitioned the court for an order transferring jurisdiction of Allen's custody from the Carroll County Sheriff to the Indiana Department of Corrections. On the same day, and without the formality of a hearing on the sheriff's request, Judge Benjamin Diener signed an order, a safekeeping order, transferring Allen's custody to the IDOC, which is uh, the Indiana Department of Corrections, uh, without Allen or his legal representatives having any input in his pretrial detainment. Uh, there's a footnote here which states, uh, oh, shit, I'm already in three. Yeah, you've okay. got to make it a little uh, smaller if you're going to get to it without switching pages. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I don't know if this is misnumbered. I'm not seeing one. No, I think one. you jumped pages again. I did. Uh, at So this is footnote one. At the time the court signed the safekeeping order, Allen had yet to be uh, appointed counsel. In fact, Allen's court-appointed public defenders, Rosie and Baldwin did not enter their appearance until number, uh, November 14th of 2022. And therefore, Allen had no input as to his pretrial detention circumstances. The record should also reflect that the safekeeping order and all other exhibits referenced herein have been personally served on the court in the form of a supplemental appendix. All right. Um, Okay, uh, and Allen was then shipped off to the Westville Correctional Facility and placed in a maximum security segregation unit referred to by prison officials as WCU. The records suggest that just prior to his transfer to the WCU, Allen may have made a brief stop at the Reception Diagnostic Center, the RDC, where some sort of intake procedure may have taken place. 
but it does not appear that Allen underwent any formal mental health assessment or testing to establish a baseline in terms of his mental health history or needs. From, a, uh, from approximately November 1 of 2022 through December of 2023, Allen remained incarcerated in the WCU. Allen's attorneys are unaware of any other pretrial detainee that has ever been housed in the WCU in the history of the facility, and most certainly not in the five or so, uh, so years preceding his placement. And then again, we've got another footnote. Footnote two, uh, Warden uh, John Gallipu, I may be butchering his name, was deposed by the defense on Friday, <clears throat> March 22nd, 2024, where he acknowledged that he had worked in the IDOC for 28 years and was the warden at Westville for approximately five years leading up to Allen's placement. Warden Gallipu, uh, or Poe, acknowledged that during his entire tenure, he was unaware of any other circumstance involving uh, the pretrial detention of a man who had not yet been convicted of a crime. See attached Gallipu or Gallipo uh, depot transcript pages 24 to 26. So Allen's attorneys have conducted depositions, uh, watched video from Allen's cell and other video from within the prison, reviewed prison records regarding Allen's detention, reviewed Allen's medical and uh, psychiatric records, and listened to audio interviews of prison inmates and guards conducted by law enforcement officials. Through this process, Allen's attorneys have learned that Allen has been accused of making incriminating statements to both inmates and guards. Nearly all of these statements appear to have occurred between mid-March of 2023 and June of 2023. During this time frame, there also exists medical slash psychiatric records suggesting that Allen was in a state of psychosis. See attached report of treatment review committee TRC hearing. Now, now while uh, you take Al that little... That's what I was going to do. Did you see that? that. <clears throat> did you see that document? Did we, did I, we, when I, we sent that by the clerk? No. So, but here's what I did some research because it's listed as an exhibit on their exhibit list. So the, the treatment review committee is used when they determine that someone needs to be placed on medication. That's almost always for psychosis, but needs to be placed on medication and they're refusing. So it is for the, um, if someone does not, is not willing to voluntarily take their medicine to treat their psychotic symptoms or whatever, then they get evaluated by the Indiana Department of Corrections Committee on Involuntary Non-Emergent Treatment. That is the Treatment Review Committee. So typically, it, it, from what I gather, um, and don't don't hold me to this, but it's what happened in a case that I while I was doing some research, that there, it seems they get referred to the treatment review committee after some sort of examination or determination. In the case that I read, it was a there was a uh, a doctor's examination. They used the medical records and they used the assessment. <clears throat> sorry, that the doctor's assessment um, that he posed a risk of harm to himself or others or suffered from a serious mental illness. So then the committee holds a hearing and they determine whether or not the person should be forced medication. Now, we don't know the outcome here. That's all we know is that that he did have this hearing. Okay. So Allen's defense team has learned that Allen was not only detained in an uh, isolation cell in WCU, but that prison officials chose to post inmates at Allen, uh, Allen's cell door and required the inmates to keep logs of all of Allen's actions, statements, and behaviors. This appears to have occurred during all hours of the day and continued over the course of much of Allen's stay in the WCU. These inmates, all of whom are convicted felons, were not only actively engage in, uh, engaging in surveilling Allen's activities, but were also communicating with him from time to time. Allen's attorneys have learned that at some point in early April of 2023, prison officials deliberately pulled the inmates from Allen's cell door and replaced them with prison guards. Allen's attorneys have learned that this appears to have been prompted by an inmate or inmates engaging Allen regarding his pending charges and communicating Allen's thoughts and words to the families of these inmates, thereby violating any sense of confidentiality that might exist within the walls of the penitentiary. Now, that's interesting. Do, do you know of an expectation of privacy within jail? Is that a thing? I, I 
thought that was extremely bizarre. I, I, I actually had a conversation with an Indiana lawyer, <clears throat> like, I'm, am I insane? Like, what in the hell? Right to, I forget the language. Neither of us knew. It was there, thereby violating any sense of confidentiality that might exist within the walls of the penitentiary. I'm I not aware. I, he, if, so can I speak? I think what of he meant to be implied. No, I'm sorry. I meant, can I cut you off? <laughs> <laughs> I think what he was meaning to convey, I think, was that like if if he were if he Richard Allen were to speak about facts, you know, like let's say he did it and he's confessing that it wouldn't get disseminated outside. I, I, I don't know. I, that's what my, I was thinking that maybe what they meant was like it would kind of stay within the walls of the prison and. Actually, I, I take it back. I've got no explanation for that language. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if there's if there's an argument that they're agents of the state and that they're essentially interrogating him, yeah, maybe that's the argument. If he if he's if he's lawyered up, I I don't know. Right, but uh, I don't know if it's fleshed out. I, I didn't get through this entire memo, so no, that that uh, I, I, let's keep not plowing much of through. An explanation. But just to be clear, we do not believe that there is any right to any sort of confidentiality for conversations within the walls of a prison. Okay, so most notably, Allen's living circumstances within the prison appear to have been designed, whether intentionally or unintentionally, to expose him to some of the harshest conditions that even the most heinous of convicted offenders have not endured. This coercive environment was initially the product of Allen being detained in an observation cell used for convicted inmates with suicidal ideations. This single cell located in the, quote, A-pod uh, is one of the approximately 60 individual segregation cells, all containing felons convicted of crimes such as burglary, robbery, child molestation, and murder. And that comes from the Gallipu uh, or Gallipo deposition page 13 each and every one of these inmates had the ability to communicate with alan by yelling at him at all hours of the day and night and by chastising him uh every time that he was removed from himself for purposes of recreation showering or at other administrative reasons alan's attorneys have learned that the, he was referred to as the quote baby killer and that he was the target of other similar accusations during his stay at the wcu see attached statement of ceo michael roberts and i know you asked who that was that's who it is. I, yeah, I guess you were looking I've through. Read that. Once I read that, <clears throat> okay. I figured it out. So, I mean, it, like, this doesn't shock me or and shouldn't shock anybody that watches our content. I mean, I, I, I told you, they in prison, they are not going to give a shit about a presumption of innocence. And in prison, they absolutely detest anybody who, who does violence of any kind whether it's physical or sexual abuse, whether it's murder, any, any kind of person that uh, harms children is on very thin ice uh, and, and probably on a, a, a very short leash in terms of their lifespan in a prison. And, you know, to have a pretrial detainee in there who is being charged with murdering two young girls, um, you can imagine what that would be like. Like, in terms of of that particular statement, it rings very true with me, and and I have no doubt that that's exactly what was going on. And CO stands for correctional officer for uh, anyone who doesn't know. And I I have this comment down here. Just remind me to address that as soon as you're done. Okay. Um, prison records reflect that Allen was placed on a quote suicide watch during the majority of his stay at WCU including his initial detention in November of 2022. See the attached adult mental health order of 11-3-2022. This, this occurred despite the fact that there were no underlying findings to suggest that he was suicidal. Allen's designation as suicidal subjected him to even harsher circumstances than those of the other offenders on the unit. For example, Allen's bed consisted of a metal plate with a thin mattress, all of which was just a few inches from the con uh, concrete floor in that was courtesy of Gallipo's uh, deposition 55 to 56. Allen was issued an anti-suicide smock, uh, which covered his body no better uh, than the garment of a caveman. Uh, see the attached mental health order of 10, uh, 11, 3, 2022. 
and video MT. I'm not going to cite the video. Y'all can read it. Um, Alan's food was served to him through a cuff portal and his dining habits involved him sitting on a bed or on the floor as his cell was not equipped with a table or a chair that would otherwise serve as even a rudimentary dining arrangement. Uh, and that's Gallipo 56 to 40, 54 to 56. Allen's cell also contained a steel toilet and a sink, both in direct line of sight of inmates and guards assigned to who uh, assigned to his surveil. The tile uh, the toilet bowl was located approximately 24 inches from his bed. Allen's attorneys learned that Allen was not only under constant surveillance, but that the lights remained on in his cell for many days and nights. It was also true that due to his quote suicide watch designation, that he was afforded less. Uh, or no recreation time and less of an opportunity for showers. See the atta uh, attached audio of CEO Timothy Weist at three and four minute mark. In essence, his suicide designation was the cause for the removal of additional privileges to the extent the word privilege even applies, which in turn further fostered an environment that led to the deterioration of Allen's mental and physical health. In all, for nearly 13 months at the WCU, Allen was deprived of any social interaction, very little to no privacy, limited recreation time, and was left to entertain himself. Unfortunately, Allen's usual, unusual detention circumstances would extend beyond the door of his isolation cell. Whenever Allen was removed from the confines of his 12 by 8 steel and concrete box, aka cell, he was shackled with ankle cuffs, a belly chain, box cuffs on his hands and guided around by guards with a lead or what most people refer to as a leash. And that comes from Gallipo's uh, Depp. And I, I'm not going to cite every, every Depp citation. Um, as if this is a restriction of his basic freedom of movement was not enough, prison officials assigned a videographer to Allen to record his movements around the prison, including when he would meet with his lawyers. During all the meetings between Allen and his attorneys, he remained shackled, as referenced above, making simple tasks difficult, such as taking a drink of water from a water bottle. Allen would not be able to communicate as much as a hand gesture due to the shackled state, due to his shackled state. During other meetings, prison officials placed a video camera outside of a window in the visitation room and required Allen to sit in a hard plastic chair directly in line with the video camera, which was less, less than 10 feet away. Allen's highly unusual detention circumstance extended even to the visits with his wife. During one visit, Allen was transported outside of the WCU to a building reserved for visitation for those inmates in general population. Allen, again, was shackled and confined during the transport and ultimately re-robed in a green jumpsuit before seeing his wife. He was, however, unshackled during the visit. His embrace, uh, his embrace with his wife was controlled by prison protocol, which permitted only a few brief seconds of contact, despite the fact that Allen had not seen his wife for the better part of six months. Allen was required to sit on the opposite side of the table from his wife and had two prison guards stationed within earshot of each of his table. They were left with absolutely no privacy. The room was completely empty. Uh, the room was completely empty except for his lawyers and a few other prison guards who were also stationed within the building. Uh, this provided no background noise what, uh, whatsoever, which might offer up some aspect of privacy uh, as he and his wife tried to. Oh, and I missed a footnote. Uh, the footnote was up uh, at the very beginning, talking about his deterioration of his mental and physical health. Footnote three is Allen's intake records with the DOC reflect that he was five foot, five foot five tall and 175 pounds at admission in November of 2022. Uh, his weight by April of 2023 had dropped to 135 pounds okay so this provided no background noise whatsoever which might offer up some aspect of privacy as he and his wife uh tried to communicate and his restrictions did not end there alan and his wife were also denied the simple concession of getting a drink of water during the visit despite the fact that there were a number of vending machines and a water fountain within 10 to 20 feet from his table uh, again, Gallipo, Depot, 70 to 70, 77 to 78. Allen's unusual detention involves even a stranger set of circumstances. During the course of the representation of Allen, his attorneys discovered the existence of dozens and dozens of police reports, audio interviews, and other investigative findings that centered on a group of suspects associated with pagan nor spiritual religious practices. These suspects considered themselves, quote, Odinists, all of which were referred, uh, referenced in the Frank's motion and memorandum and second Frank's motion and memorandum previously filed with this court. 
and that is footnote four, uh, which states that the facts and circumstances surround the possibility that these individuals otherwise known as known as Odinists are specifically referenced in the Frank's motion and memo filed with this court on September 18th of 2023 and October 2nd, 2023, respectively. <clears throat> Okay, Allen incorporates herein the details referenced in the Franks filings rather than restating the lengthy details in the memorandum. Allen's lawyers also discovered that at least two guards assigned to his pod and or his movements around the facility also held themselves out to be affiliated with the pagan Norse god known as, quote, Odin. See affidavits of Joshua Robinson and Randy Jones. The guards probably displayed their Odinistic beliefs on their own prison uniforms, despite the fact that such a display was in direct violation of their uniform policy, Gallipo, uh, 97 to 109. Uh, at least, uh, on at least, and uh, on at least one occasion, one of these guards tased Allen after he was placed into his secure 8 by 10 12 cell because Allen refused to remove his hands from the cuff port in the door of his cell, a cuff port that is barely large enough uh, which to slide a meal tray. Uh, see video. Allen posed absolutely no risk to anyone at the time that he was tased. Al's, uh, Allen also battled depression throughout most of his adult life. He was medicated over the course of his life and, in fact, had sought out therapeutic resources to treat and manage his depression. See uh, pages four to five of the INE. And that is the independent neuropsychological evaluation dated 331 24, offered up to the court in appendix form. Uh, the IODC gave very little consideration to Allen's condition at the time of his intake and initial incarceration in the WCU, especially given the unusual circumstances in which he was detained. It is also believed that Allen's medications were administered in a less than consistent fashion when he was on the unit, all of which have contributed to his inability to endure his living environment during his pretrial detention at the WCU issue. Uh, the issue in this case is what are the state violated Allen's Fifth and Sixth Amendment rights and federal and state due process rights by detaining, uh, detaining him in solitary confinement in a maximum security prison segregation unit uh, while he was awaiting trial. Allen's statements were involuntary and should be suppressed. The rule, uh, coercive police activity is a uh, necessary predicate to a finding that a confession is involuntary within the meaning of uh, the due process clause, and that is Colorado v. Conley. 479 U.S. 157, that's a U.S. Supreme Court case. However, a coercive police activity is not a necessary prerequisite to challenge the voluntariness of a defendant's statement under Article 1, Section 14 of the Indiana Constitution, as there may be other elements that would tend to find a, a support a finding of involuntariness, and that is State v. Banks, uh, 2 Northeast 3rd, 71, the proper standard under the Indiana Constitution uh, is whether the confession was, quote, freely self-determined in the product of a rational intellect and free will. And that is, end quote, Hurt v. State, uh, 594 Northeast 2nd, 1212. That's an Indiana Court of Appeals case from 1998. Thus, courts look to the totality of the circumstances to determine if the confession was voluntary, taking into account many factors, including one, whether the statement was made under or, uh, a court order, two, the use of police trickery, three, threats or promises by police, four, defendant's race, age, or disability, five, length of detention, six, physical coercion, or seven, illegal uh, police practices. Got anything to say there? Well, <clears throat> what do you want to hold uh, off to? Yeah, I'll, I'll hold off. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Analysis, notwithstanding the lower standard for showing uh, involuntariness set by the Indiana Constitution, it is indisputable that Allen's detention circumstances were manufactured by the Carroll County Sheriff purposefully and without the existence of any sense of due process as a court signed the safekeeping order without requiring the state to establish the burden of proof required by the statute. But this was just the beginning. Allen was then shipped off to WCU and immediately placed on a suicide watch in a detention cell where he had little to no accommodations, not even those afforded to, uh, up to offered up to the other 2,000 convicted inmates housed across the prison yard. See the entirety of Gallipo's depot. Almost simultaneous with Allen's isolation from human contact, 
prison companions were placed at his doorstep and tasked with the duty of reporting his every move and recording his every word. And the, again, that's Gallipo's DAP 125 to 126. The companions appeared to have gone above and beyond this duty, but communicating with Alan about his case and even praying with him as he struggled to withstand the rigors of his incarceration. See the statement of guard Michael Roberts, minute 38. Their mere presence at his doorstep is akin to Messiah v. U.S. 377, U.S. 201, uh, 1964. That's another U.S. Supreme Court case where police obtained incriminating statements from a jailhouse informant who engaged the defendant in a conversation and developed a relationship of trust and confidence with the defendant such that he revealed incriminating information about the charged crime when the count when counsel was not present. And that's it at 203. Do you want to explain what it is in case people want to nerd out back, and read case it's law? It's just referring back to the case before it. And, you know, Messiah is, is it's one of the, one of the strong cases <laughs> for the argument that, that they're making right now. Okay. And 203 is the page, page of that case. If you want to ever, again, if you want to nerd out and read cases, that's how you do it. Uh, the court held, that this was improper and suppressed uh, and suppressed the statements it at 206 207 this trial court should do the same the trial court's decision regarding admissibility of a confession or incriminating statement is controlled by determining from the totality of the circumstances whether the statement was given voluntarily rather than induced through violence threats coercion or other improper influence so as to <clears throat> overcome the defendant's free will uh, and they cite uh, Hartman v state 988 northeast second 785 to indiana case from 2013 see also treadway 924 northeast second 621 that's an indiana case from 2010 uh, and then finally griffith v state 788 northeast second 835 in the indiana 2003 case standard indicators of our voluntariness include whether the confession was freely self-determined the product of a rational intellect and free will without compulsion or inducement of any sort, and whether the accused will was overborne, it at 841. So they were citing back to Griffith on that particular uh, little piece of language from that case. Here, Allen's free will was overcome by the forces of his environment, all of which were placed upon him by the government and its actors. Allen, a man with a bona fide pre-existing mental health issues with bona fide pre-existing mental health issues was detained in an isolation cell entirely isolated from any sense of meaningful human contact and then offered up the most basic amenities of life through a cuff port a hole in his door he was reduced to sleeping on a mattress that was placed on the top of his steel plate just a few inches from the floor the same mattress and floor also doubled as his dining table because his cell had no such accommodations his attire was reduced to nothing more than a suicide smock covering only a portion of his body uh, allen's healthiest accommodations came in the form of recreation time not to exceed four hours per week gallopo uh depot page 30 in this space there was not enough room to jog or run uh, only an exercise bike and a pull-up bar, Gallipo Depot, 32 to 34. Allen's other accommodation uh, would have been a window slit that was inside of his cell. His view of anything outside of the boundaries of the penitentiary would have been impaired by the rusty chain link and razor wire of at least two separate fences between him and any sense of freedom. To the extent that Allen was ever allowed to be removed from his cell, he was shackled at the ankles, wrists further confined by a belly chain and, and cuff port, and guided around the prison on a leash, uh, all ideal ways to confine and control the movements of a convicted killer or some other convict who, in addition to his conviction, posed a threat to himself or the prison staff. Allen, at five foot, five inches tall and 173 pounds soaking wet, and... Uh, with not one single criminal conviction on his rap sheet, met none of these conditions. CWC Suicide Forum 11-8-2022. As if this treatment wasn't enough, Allen was forced to endure the uh, intimacies of his restraint system even while he was meeting with his court-appointed lawyers inside the confines of the Maximum Security Segregation Unit located inside Westville Correction Facility. And uh, to add insult to injury, Allen's meeting with his attorneys occurred while he had a, 
a video camera aimed at his face, recording sessions that should have been afforded the most private of environments uh, so as to protect the relationship between attorney and client. All of this occurred while Allen's medications were, be uh, were being adjusted by the prison medical team, the combination of which factors reduced him to nothing more than a human experiment. Allen's free will was overcome. Under the Indiana Constitution, the voluntariness of a confession must be proved beyond a reasonable doubt. And in reviewing voluntariness, the court looks, uh, the courts look at the totality of the circumstances, reviewing all the evidence in the record rather than focusing only on the evidence supporting the finding of voluntariness. Pruitt v. State 834 92nd 90. Uh, and that's Indiana 2005 case. Under the U.S. Constitution, prosecution only has to prove by a preponderance of the evidence that the confession was voluntary. Smith v. State, 689 Northeast 2nd, 1238, uh, and that's Indiana 1997 case. And Lego v. Uh, Tuomi, 404 U.S., 477 in 1977, uh, 1972 U.S. Supreme Court case. As explained below, the state cannot meet its burden of showing voluntariness here, even applying the lower standard of preponderance. The federal courts have a long history of regulating the admission of, quote, confessions that have been a product of state action that exploits the weak and compromised through inter uh, inter interrogatory and custodial processes. In Blackburn v. State of Alabama, 80 uh, Supreme Court 274, 1960, the Supreme Court noted that it had recognized, quote, that coercion can be uh, mental as well as physical, and that the blood of the, the accused is not only the hallmark of an unconstitutional inquisition, a number of cases have demonstrated, if demonstration were needed, that the efficiency, the efficiency of the rack and the, and the thumbscrew can be matched, given the proper subject, by more sophisticated modes of, quote, persuasion, a prolonged interrogation of an accused who is ignorant of his rights and who has been cut off from the moral support of friends and relatives is not infrequently an ineffective uh, an technique of terror. Thus, the range of inquiry in this type of case must be broad, and this court has insisted that the judgment in each instance be based upon consideration of, quote, the totality of the circumstances, circumstances citation omitted it's pretty powerful pretty powerful language from the supreme court um I, alan's case falls that? within the is there a footnote yeah but oh no that's just the end of a quote i I, yeah. I, I wonder if they meant to to still cite that's the internal citations are omitted they should have still Cited unless it's oh it's the site right above it okay so that's basically saying the internal citations are omitted because the way those quotes are means that the second half of this is a quote from another case where Blackburn is citing to language that probably the United States Supreme Court used in an earlier case yeah and that's the site that's omitted I don't know if anyone actually cares about that so I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sure there's at least five law nerds in here that care. Um, and I care. So you go. Uh, Allen's case falls within these federal parameters. In Blackburn, the defendant had a documented history of mental illness, having served in the military, which ultimately resulted in his discharge because of a medical finding that he suffered from some form of psychosis. It at 200 to 201. He was in the process of being treated in the days and weeks leading up to the commission of a crime and his ultimate apprehension, it at 201. After enduring an eight to 10 hour interrogation, Blackburn was given a prepared written statement with admissions offered up by him in the course of the interrogation. And he ultimately signed the written statement two days later, it at 204. Here, Allen endured a longer, more sustained form of interrogation, one that lasted more than five months before he finally broke, already suffering from a bona fide mental health disorder, and then having been cut off from the moral support of his wife, his mother, and his daughter, Alan was weakened to the point where he slipped into a state of psychosis, plagued with grossly disorganized, dis uh, delusional, paranoid, and highly dysfunctional behavior, INE, page 124. These behaviors were manifested through verbal confessions that he may have been drugged, <clears throat> verbal confessions to the double homicide inconsistent with known facts about the crime scene periods of not sleeping for days paranoia stripping off his clothes 
drinking toilet water, covering himself with and eating his own feces and many other socially unacceptable behaviors. Uh, God, that's fucking cruel. On one occasion, Alan confessed uh, to molesting those two young girls and shooting them in the back. So there's our first, our first indication of what he's confessed to. So, and um, I want to occasion... comment here and uh, that you'll note that what they cite to is not a recording of his actual statement, but the statements made by people claiming he made these statements. So I, I just right. find that very compelling because I was under the assumption that if he's on a phone call, that phone call is being recorded and the defense would have the actual recording of his statements. But all we have is hearsay. So, so far, well, not, so far, not that, hearsay that mean... because it's a statement against interest. But uh, I mean, what, what I don't know, because we haven't finished the document, we're getting close to the end of it. Um, I mean, we have been told that there were phone calls, right? So I guess we'll let, we'll discuss it when we're done reading it. Uh, okay. So one, on one occasion, Alan quote, confessed to quote, molesting those two girls and shooting them in the back end quote, see attached transcribed statement of inmate companion, like uh, Lacey Patton jr. Line 16 to 17 on another occasion, he professed his sorrow for molesting Abby and Libby, uh, and others, which he spe uh, specifically named CO Michael Roberts statements between 15 and 16 minute mark. Uh, these facts are known to be falsities, none of which are supported by the autopsy findings by Dr. Roland Core as to the cause of death of the girls and unsupported by the absence of any evidence that either of the girls were sexually assaulted near or before the time of their deaths. Uh, see attached autopsy reports regarding Abigail Williams and Liberty German. At the and time, I just want to note, Ward sorry to interrupt you right there, because, but I'll forget that they cannot necessarily tell whether or not someone has been sexually assaulted before. So, yes, they can say there's no redness, there's no, you know, no, you know, overt evidence of it, but it's not a determination that can, you know, be made concretely to say there was none. Um, you know, at a, at a, at a date prior and, and not, um, every vaginal penetration changes, you know, the hymen and, you know, things like that. So I, I just wanted to comment on that. Not that I'm saying okay. that he sexually molested them or assaulted them. I'm just saying what I said. <clears throat> okay. Noted. Noted. Um, all right. On another occasion, he professed his sorrow for molesting Abby and Libby and others, which he specifically named CO Michael Roberts statement between 15 and 16. Uh, these facts are known to be falsities. None, none of which are supported by the autopsy findings by Roland Core uh, as to the cause of death of the girls and unsupported by the absence of any evidence that either one of the girls were sexually assaulted near or before the time of their deaths uh, at the time. Allen uttered these falsities. The state actors were in the, quote, ready position with pen in hand, documenting the entirety of Allen's mental and physical deterioration and actions stemming therefrom. The infringement on Allen's legal rights didn't stop here. Inmate companions then spread, quote, the good word of Allen's, quote, confessions to inmates and general population at Westville, prompting these inmates to then share information with their respective family members in public. Uh, see attached transcripts of Lacey Patton, Jr. inmate, and Jason Ellen, uh, Elliott, inmate. Proof of these leaks were offered up by the state in the form of uh, audio recorded interviews and accompanying transcripts and included in large volume of discovery dumps uh, received by the defense in the recent past. Neither, However, neither Allen nor his legal defense team are, uh, are aware of any self-reporting uh, are aware of any self-reporting of said leaks by the state to the defense or by the state to the court, despite the fact that the state was aware of this information as early as May 12th of 2023, when Patton and Elliott were interviewed by law enforcement investigators, Allen's due process rights have all been, been ignored. 
It has also established that the 14th Amendment forbids, quote, fundamental unfairness in the use of evidence, whether true or false. Uh, and that's Lazenba v. People versus the state of California, 13 U.S. 219. Um, as important as it is that persons who have committed crimes be convicted, there are considerations that transcend the question of guilt or innocence. Thus, in cases involving involuntary confessions, this court enforces the strong, uh, strongly felt attitude of our society that important human values are sacrificed when an agency of the government, in the course of securing a conviction, wrings a confession out of an accused against his will. This insistence upon putting the government to task of proving guilt by means other than an inquisition was engendered by historical abuses, which are quite familiar. See Chambers v. State of Florida, 309 U.S. at pages 235 through 238, and Watts v. State of Indiana, uh, 388 U.S. at pages 54 through 55. The truth or falsity of Allen's statements are of no consequence to this analysis. Allen has been treated unlike any other pretrial detainee in Indiana in recent history. The, method, uh, the methodology employed by the justice system is one of first and uh, one of first impression, and therefore the circumstances created by this methodology should not be part of any consideration of Allison, uh, of Al's, Allen's guilt or innocence. The system of pretrial detention employed against Allen runs afoul of the Fifth and Sixth Amendments of the United States Constitution in Article 1, Section 14 of the Indiana Constitution. It is for these reasons any and all incriminating statements made by Allen while incarcerated should be suppressed. And that's that. <clears throat> okay, so let me just so I don't forget circle back to the question that now I won't remember who who made it, but it was up there for a while. Is there a difference between suppressing and excluding? And I'm gonna backtrack a little on 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 how harsh I was sort of on the things that other things that could have been admitted because or included in this motion. So suppression deals with is typically referring to situations where the police have done something you know, violated his Fifth Amendment right to, you know, not incriminate himself, violated his Sixth Amendment right to counsel um, or his Fourth Amendment, if that was in play here. So that would be suppression as like a because the police violated his rights, it should be suppressed. When I'm saying exclude, that is something that could come by way of a motion in Lemonade um, to exclude it again because it's more prejudicial than probative based on the factors that it's unre unreliable, as has indicia of, of falsity, his mental state at the time, that it just has no probative value. And it's so extremely prejudicial, it should be excluded as opposed to suppressed. So it's just a different ground to accomplish the same thing. And, and when you're saying something's unreliable, so it should be left out, something you know is inadmissible for some other reason, that's a request to exclude as opposed to suppress. Um, and then you you asked me sort of mid on like did I want to did I want to comment? Um, and the reason and I, I know decided you do. <laughs> the reason I decided to wait was just I I kind of think they they missed the mark on arguing that the, that it interfered with his Sixth Amendment right to counsel. They did a lot of Fifth Amendment arguments. Um, arguments that his confession was involuntary. However, I think even the stronger argument is that by police, you know, police, law enforcement, state actors, they violated his right to counsel because anytime after you're indicted, you have the right to counsel at all stages. No, they cannot come and question you and wait for you to assert your right to counsel. Once you have been indicted that's you know that's it so and he did cite the messiah case in in that section but he didn't argue the fact that 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 more goes to interference with his sixth amendment right to counsel by the use of an informant to elicit elicit incriminating statements after he's already been you know indicted um and then I'm trying to go back to it because I'm, I'm looking at it on PDF because so 
Do you want me to pull the thing. document up nope. again? I've got it. I've got it. So the part that Bob was reading when he asked if I wanted to comment was about coercive police activity is necessary to predicate uh, a necessary predicate to a finding that a confession is involuntary within the meaning of the due process clause. And he cited uh, uh, the case that that speaks to that. And he distinguished here through, but under the Indiana Constitution, you can get there. Um, there are other elements that speak to involuntariness. But even in Colorado v. Conley, it, police activity in, in this case, I think he could be argued that the police, by setting up this situation, by, and when I say police, I just mean state actors, you know, the, the, the IDOC didn't do this on their own accord, <laughs> you know, but um, that they set it up for them to sit out there. And it sounds like they were, <clears throat> you know, screaming and yelling at him. Now, clearly they're not going to have people sit out there with pat notepads, multiple people to write everything down if they don't think he's going to say something. I mean, clearly <clears throat> that's what is expected or intended. I don't know what it looked like. You know, could they hear each other through the walls? It, it, there was allegations that they were screaming, keeping him awake, things like that. So <clears throat> I do think that that could be considered coercive police activity. Um, because in, and I'm pretty sure it was the Colorado v. Conley case that he cited, um, the, like the guy suffered a mental condition and he, he confessed to the police and the argument was, yeah, I'm 99.9% .9 sure this is, yeah, this is Conley. Okay. Was that he was being told by God to confess and he was listening to the voice of God. So it wasn't, you know, voluntary. And they're like, well, no, you need coercive police activity. In this case, in, in that case, the Conley case, the police didn't do anything wrong. They just wrote down what somebody said. And the fact that he was driven by a mental condition to say it, they decided did not uh, implicate the voluntariness, you know, <clears throat> part of the constitution. However, the, they specifically noted that mental condition may be a significant factor in voluntariness. It's just not like that's it. So in here, we do have a lot more than just his, you know, mental condition. We do have that the, that the state actors set up the entire situation that got him there. And even not only talking about his detainment conditions, but the fact that they had those, they had placed people there for the sole purpose of, you know, getting inmates, incriminating. inmates yeah, of, with, with notepads. And, and I think that of great significance is the fact that this all happened when he was not represented by anyone that this happened without a hearing where he was brought in, where he's moved to a, a, a prison and again, if you guys, I'm sure if you've watched our content in the past, you understand that that um, typically pretrial detainees are housed in jails, not prisons. Uh, it's very unusual uh, for a pretrial detainee to be housed with the convicts, the convicted felons. And um, th the fact that they seem to be setting this up very early on in terms of getting him into conditions wherein two things were, were going to take place. One, they could keep him in much more uh, severe confinement conditions than they could in a county jail. And two, he was much further away from his attorneys. Those two things alone, to me, um, are indicative of, of this was a, a, a grander scheme by state agents. As you said, I don't believe that that the prison uh, or the guards in and of themselves uh, went to these lengths in order to, to get him to start talking. And, you know, in any case like this, and again, all I have to go by is uh, despite what other people have said, I'm not privy to any of the discovery in this case. All I have seen is, is the uh, probable cause affidavit and what I've heard from the defense and what I've seen in the probable cause affidavit is weak. And, and when and I you see heard from the defense in open court or in their pleadings, you mean? Sure. 
Yeah. Right. Well, I, yeah, that's what I said. Um, at least as far as the pleadings, you know, when, when you have a case where on its face, um, and, and granted, I have no idea what they've collected post arrest, but when you have a case where the state believes that it's tenuous, um, and believe me, every prosecutor on the planet, if you were to ask them, is going to evaluate the strength of their case along the way. You know, initially they're going to say, OK, do I think that we have enough uh, for the arrest? Yeah. Do I think that we have enough for the conviction? Not by a long shot, but that's not going to stop them from making the arrest necessarily. And I think that that's what happened in this case. I think that they firmly believe that when they searched Allen's home, and then when they got all of his devices, that they were going to find things, which if we're to believe the defense's filings, they did not. They did not find the things that they were hoping to find that was going to connect him to the girls. And I think at that point, it, it, it becomes a, a very desperate situation wherein a confession is mandatory. You know, like, like take take these confessions out of this case with what we know and where are we at? You know, if you're looking at this case objectively, if you understand anything about the criminal process and, and the burden that has to be met by the state, where are we at without this confession? We're left with three to four shaky witnesses, all of which gave a different description of Allen. Uh, we're left with an unspent casing ejected from his weapon that the state is claiming they were able to subjectively match to Richard Allen's weapon that was recovered from the search. and. What else do we have? Really? We have a person who looks and like him at someone. The bridge. That, yeah, but a, and a person who looks like someone who the state put an expert together to say looks like someone else that 12 other people had called in tips saying, hey, I recognize that person that looks like, you know, whatever his name is. Is that Logan or I get Holder and Logan confused, but um, the the. Uh, hope you know, hopefully, I mean, I, I'm assuming that the state's going to deal with the with the 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 issue of of bridge guy. I mean, they're going to have to deal with it at trial. I, I know that some people are satisfied and they're convinced that it's Alan. And and if he's the if he's the culprit, if he's the person who did this, I, I sure the hell hope that they have it. I hope that they can tie it together better than they did in that PCA because nothing I've seen. Uh, and any of the pleadings has convinced me, nor is anything that I've seen by any of the creators trying to make it so that it is Alan, has convinced me that it's him. Um, and beyond that, again, and I'm going to keep restating this, that that my biggest issue is that I have seen no no evidence in any of the pleadings whatsoever as to the time of death of the girls. There's this assumption that, that they were killed shortly after they were kidnapped. And I, I've, I've seen no evidence of that. Does that mean that it doesn't exist? No, it doesn't. That's why we have trial. That's why, even though I think that that PCA leans innocent, I have no idea whether Rick Allen's innocent or guilty because I'm not privy to the, the, the discovery and the evidence in the case. And, and neither is anybody else. And I think that that's the point that just continually gets lost on everybody when they discuss our coverage of this case we are we are pro constitution we are pro we are pro defendant in the sense that every single defendant in this country and and if they want to call it lofty constitutional goals that's the only thing that we have in this country without that piece of paper we ain't got jack shit and you people out there that that just don't want to believe that need to correct yourself because you just don't understand this country was based out of like on, on, like we invented this country we invented the the system of government it did not exist prior to that thing being written so for people to be dismissing it as just some piece of paper uh and, and you know and, and lofty lofty language of the the constitution is absurd to me and frankly it's offensive you know, I mean, if people don't care about the Constitution, that's their problem. They'll care when somebody, one of their loved ones gets arrested, then they'll care about it because it's all we right. have. It's all we yeah. have as citizens in this country. And and I, I'm going to leave it at that. You know, the question I have for you, Ali, I don't know. I, I was under the impression that that there were phone calls that were made from Allen to, to Kathy Allen and to his mother. So, so am I. In your and I'm estimation, assuming... Go ahead. No, I want to hear your question. 
Okay. In, in, in your estimation, does this particular motion cover those if they do indeed exist? Or is he only seeking to uh, either exclude or suppress the statements contained therein in this, in this memo? No, I, I think that he ended with, and I guess we should go back to his, uh, to the motion itself, but I thought he sought to suppress all statements made between, you know, a certain date and a certain date. But I, I do have to say, I'm going to assume that he does have the recorded statements from these phone calls and maybe it's an unfair assumption, but the fact that they're not referenced in here makes me think that there, you know, wasn't any things that they could point to in that. Um, I kind of would expect that if in there he was sort of speaking nonsensical or, you know, seemed disorganized in his thoughts, seemed disorganized in his speech, that that would be in here and that they would be pointing those things out. So I don't know. That's just, so what, you know, what do you glean from that? If anything, right. That, that there's, there are no sort of red flags in the recorded statements is what when you, I'm when you say from. red flags, do you mean where they're, they're again, they're more problematic for the defense or they're less problematic for the defense. I meant that there's no red flags that he would use here that speak to it being false or unreliable, such as his speech was disorganized. His, he was speaking nonsensical. He made any sort of comments that were inconsistent with fact, whether it be about the actual crime or just other things that he said in those conversations. I, I would expect if his he was speaking really quickly, if he was saying something that didn't follow, you know, logical lines of the conversation, that they would have pointed those things out here is what I think. All right. And, and just to kind of drive home the point. Uh, so Alan is asking that this court suppresses evidence in this cause, any and all oral and written communications, confession statements and or admissions uh, alleged to have been made by defendant Allen during his pretrial de uh, detention in this cause. So they're, they're seeking to have all of them um, suppressed in your in your opinion, if, if they didn't touch upon uh, the other confessions that may exist, meaning that they're not putting them in front of the judge in terms of a hearing, how are they going to be able to have them excluded? Now, I mean, it, will, I mean, will it be a, a, a broader picture that, that the judge would have to find that, that the conditions of his confinement that, that that those in turn deemed all of his confessions to be coercive, you know, or or given under coercive conditions. Does he not say in 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 this document in the actual motion what st statements sought to be suppressed were obtained? So it just says all the statements between. He never mentions phone calls. He said in the motion itself, he says that the statements, uh, he says it's alleged that defendant communicated incriminating statements to state actors and or their uh, agents, all of which the state of Indiana intends to present to a jury at the trial in this cause. Uh, the well, I don't know. It makes it seem like there are, no, are, there are no other statements. Yeah, well, that that's what I'm getting at. Yeah, but that's didn't what he I'm getting say, at. Didn't McClellan, McClellan, what the hell is his name? McClellan. Didn't the state McClellan say that he made confessions to his wife on the phone. Isn't that like words he spoke? I, I to be honest with you, I, I can't remember. Can't remember. I, I don't know if we have the trail. Like that, that's a transcript that I'd love to have because there, there's been a, like an internal debate within my head as to whether or not it was Rosie who brought the confessions up first in that June hearing or whether it was McClellan. Well, you, you could know, go and, back and to your, you're live on that because you remembered it when you said it because it was right afterwards. Yeah, maybe, maybe not. You know what I mean? So it's like we need I the transcripts would, for things like that. Yeah, we could order it. And but I would say what I would typically do is say we're seeking to suppress the statement made on this day, on this time, on this day, on this time, on this day, on this time, based on that. 
he's only seeking to exclude the statements <coughs> made to state actors and their families or whoever. Well, Wait, I mean, but that, read that it again. contradicts what, what we... families. How well, would you speak to state actors' families? Do you need a water? <laughs> Sorry. Sound like a little cat trying to get rid of a fur ball. Um, okay, so again, like here it says yeah. that, oh, this, that they are Sorry. respectfully request this court suppresses evidence in this cause, any and all oral and written communications confession statements or admissions alleged to have been made by defendant Allen during his pretrial detention in this cause. And then it goes down and paragraph two says during the course of defendants, Allen's pretrial, uh, pretrial detention, it is alleged that Allen communicated incriminating statements to state actors and or their agents, all of which the state of Indiana intends to present at trial uh, to a jury at trial in this cause statements were involuntary uh, the statements sought to be suppressed were obtained as a result of psychological and mental coercion illegally directed against the defendant, and, uh, and such statements were therefore involuntarily given. And then the statements sought to be suppressed were obtained as a result of physical coercion illegally directed against the defendant, and such statements were therefore involuntarily given. That's why I was asking you if you felt that these th that this motion is directed at everything. I mean, in the, in the opening paragraph, he certainly is asking for everything, but in terms of specifics, he's only relating to confessions that were made to state actors. Now, th does that, is that change because of, yeah. I mean, does that change your opinion? If we're, if we are to assume that there are also recorded statements to his family member that he made on the phone, and that he, the lawyers, intentionally didn't include to seek to suppress those. Well, then now I think that those must be not harmful to him at all, almost beneficial, which I can't imagine how, um, or that they don't exist. <laughs> right. Well, because I mean, all of the conditions of his confinement would exist for those phone calls to his wife and his mother as well. You Correct. know what I'm saying? So it's like, he easily could have added those in here without getting into the specifics of what they said and just made that statement that all Correct. these conditions. So I, I don't know. I, I don't know what to, I don't know what to take from that. I, I don't, I, I guess we'll have to wait and see until we get to trial. Um, so this is just a uh, list of exhibits that were included along with the memo. Uh, it was the court order of November 3rd of 2022, shortly after he was arrested, the depths of Gallipo, uh, certificate of certain questions and the depth upon oral examination of Gallipo and the affidavit of his, uh, of Gallipo's as well. The report of treatment review committee, the TRC hearing audio statement of Michael Roberts, uh, in, uh, Indiana department of corrections and mental health order from 11, three of 2022. There's a Westville video, uh, the audio statement of another CEO, um, Timothy Weist, or he might be an inmate, actually. I think he is an I inmate. So. I agree. I thought Michael Roberts was a CEO, though, so I don't know. Uh, affidavit is. of Sergeant Joshua Roberts, uh, Robinson, Westville Correctional Officer. Affidavit of Randy Jones. Those are the two Odin Patch dudes. Uh, Westville video, another one. Uh, independent neuropsychological evaluation by Dr. Polly Westcott. This is the uh, the doctor that McClellan put on blast in his third request for um, Allen's medical records and mental health records. Uh, there's a uh, Westville WCU suicide monitoring from 11 8 of 2022. Abby and Libby's autopsies in the statements of inmate Lacey Patton and uh, inmate Jason Elliott. So those were the guys that were calling their families apparently and telling them that Alan confessed. And I'll just note that so the, the autopsies are included because, as he said, these statements are inconsistent with the evidence on the on the girls, you know, as far as being shot in the back and um, any evidence of any sort of sexual assault. And then there's another uh, motion that was filed to 
uh, take the deposition of another inmate who has not been mentioned in any of this. So that must be someone that they believe, you know, might have some information about what was going on during this time. Right. Um, so another filing was, uh, that was filed as well today oh. was motion for leave of court to conduct inmate depths. That's what I was so just this talking is, about, right? Yeah. comes now defendant Allen, uh, by Brad Rosie, uh, pursuant to 38 of the Indiana rules of trial procedure respectfully requests this court issue an order granting leave of court, allowing defendant Allen's legal team to conduct depositions of inmates at the Westville correction facility. In support of said motion, uh, Allen states as follows that the parties are in the process of de conducting discovery by way of depositions in preparation for the May 13, 2024 trial uh, in this cause. Uh, paragraph 2, the state in, uh, in its witness and exhibit list, March 8th of 2024, has identified a number of correctional officers and inmates that the state intends to call as witnesses in this cause. Most, if not all, of these inmates are associated with the Westfield Correctional Facility where Defendant Allen was housed for over a year before his transfer in December of 2023. Three, um, the defense desires to depose one incarcerated individual, Jesse James. Uh, four, Rosie believes that inmate James is currently housed in the Westville Correctional Facility. Five, the Westville Correctional Facility is located in a fairly remote area. Rosie has attempted to secure a location to conduct said depositions in the town of Westville, just a mile or two down the road, but has been unable to do so due to the fact that Westville is a very small town with very few locations that are suitable for such a circumstance. Six, Rosie was able to seek out and secure a place at the LaPorte County Sheriff's Department in LaPorte, Indiana, approximately 20 miles from Westville. This is the closest and most accommodating location, uh, location where Rosie was able to secure an adequate space to conduct depositions of the above referenced inmate and other prison employees not referenced in this pleading. Uh, seven, Rosie respectfully requested this course, uh, this court issue an order granting his request to conduct depositions of inmate James. Uh, eight, Rosie has made arrangements for said depositions to occur at the LaPorte County Sheriff's Department on Thursday, April 18th, 2024, commencing at 8 a.m., at which time Rosie desires to depose inmate James. And nine, finally, Rosie requested this court issue an order granting leave of court and directing the Indiana Department of Corrections to transport inmate Jesse James to said deposition and thereafter return Jesse James to his respective location of incarceration. So, you know, it, at that because point, he's, he's not one of the people that have already been referenced. That's what I was correct. sort of getting at before. Yeah. And Correct. then there was something else I wanted to, to mention about the uh, motion um, or the memorandum, whatever the case may be. Oh, hey, baby. <laughs> um, Hi. So I'm going to assume, based on the fact that they have filed many motions seeking to move him, pointing out his mental state deteriorating, that they, being his lawyers, did not already know that he was eating his own feces, spreading his own feces all over his body, things like that, which I think is very helpful to the defense to combat any arguments like, well, if this was hap if X, Y, and Z was happening to him, for example, we talked before about guards threatening him or even whatever the inmates were doing to keep him up, to harass him, to get him to speak. Uh, if he even spoke to them, I mean, I, I you know, I'm not going to believe anything that an inmate necessarily says, but um, uh, it, it just speaks to that because it's the, it, it, and also speaks to that he was not malingering, meaning faking, just a the right. medical word for that. Because if you're doing that to get some sort of benefit from it, you'd be like, uh, hey, lawyers, I uh, was eating my own feces, spread it all over my body. It really must be something wrong with me. Right. Yeah. I so mean, I just I, I think it just speaks to volumes as far as, you know, what what may come as far as things that they learn that he was enduring or going through that that facilitated some of this that people say, well, why wouldn't he have told his lawyers that clearly he was in no condition to do any of that because they didn't even know he was eating his own feces. Yeah, I mean, it's. uh it's cruel, you know, um, 
I mean, look, in retrospect, if it turns out that Allen's the guy, then I'm not feeling so bad, you know, but, but at, at this phase, um, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about somebody who's presumed innocent and um, who has not had the benefit of a trial yet. It's cruel. It's cruel and unusual punishment in my estimation. It's uh, I mean, they're, they're, it's a, just a continuing um, assault uh, in order to, you know, and it, it's one of those things that, that you and I talk about, not just in this case, but in all cases, you know, I mean, the, the power of the state is overwhelming. You know, if you ask any defense attorney anywhere in this country, it is a enormous mountain that we have to climb to defeat the state in any case. And, you know, when, when you have a case where you believe your client's innocent, if you can try to, to wrap your mind around how terrifying that, that is to be the defense attorney who all of it lays on your shoulders, um, then maybe you'll have an understanding of, of why Alice and I give a shit about this stuff, you know? Um, right. Cause it would be I, a hell of a lot easier as far as, podcasts and youtube to take the side of the masses which is just to focus on like he's guilty we've got someone arrested you know it, we're, but bob and i are, are used to taking the opposite side not to say the person arrested isn't guilty but to stand up for their rights in general and to take a stance like this is wrong the way someone is being treated pre-trial this is wrong this is interfering with his right to a to a fair trial. So we're, you know, very thick skinned in that regard and used to the public perception that we are the bad guys because we are helping the bad guys. And like Bob's said many a times, a lot of what kind of drives him with doing this is trying to educate the public on the importance of defense attorneys and what we do and the feedback that he's gotten from so many people who are like, okay, I can appreciate, I can now appreciate defense attorneys because like I said, if this is all about, you know, getting, you know, people to listen or doing whatever, then taking the side of the masses is uh, uh, obviously way easier. A much better, right? Way, way easier. Okay. And I want to easier. Answer. And, and, yeah, yeah. And, and, Hold on, like I'm, I'm not ready to jump to questions yet, unless you have a specific right. one that you want to question or you want to answer. No, I'll, I'll get back you know, to it. Go ahead. But, and I think that that's something that people just kind of lose sight of when they become um, immersed in a particular case is that, you know, when Alice and I are talking about general principles of law and and constitutional rights. Uh, even if we're talking about them with respect to a specific defendant, you have to look at the bigger picture. You have to look at if, and again, on a micro level, like when I tell you the stories about how, when we file a motion to suppress evidence, because law enforcement has violated somebody's fourth amendment, right. Uh, and the, the police have conducted an illegal search and seizure. The, the bigger picture is, is not that defendant. The bigger picture is that if we don't file those motions, calling the cops on their illegal actions, on their violations of, of our, our constitutional rights, then, then that just expands. And they, then the state begins to feel that they're, they're, they're going unchecked, that no one's out there to stop them from doing whatever the hell they want to do. And if you don't care about that, I don't know what to tell you. But I, but I'm going to say you're welcome that there are people that do. And, right. and and that is every defense attorney that I know that actually gives a shit that is in there fighting against the, the, the most powerful entity that exists in this country, in this country, which is the government. They have all the money. They have all the resources. They've got all the manpower that one could ever want. And, and it's, it's the lowly criminal defense attorney that everyone loves to hate. Uh, that is out there fighting for our rights on a daily basis in every courtroom, in every county, in every state of this union. 
So, you know, the next time you want to shit on a defense attorney, whether it's me, whether it's my wife or whether it's somebody else, just think about that. Try to think about what we really do, you know? Um, and, and as far as like, I, I'm going to kind of get off my soapbox now. Cause I, I want to ask you, you know, we're, mm -hmm. we're officially, yeah, 30, I think 32 days out, depending on how many days are in May from this trial. And I don't know about you, and I don't know where these guys are at in their prep, but I'm nervous. <laughs> I'm nervous Absolutely. that they're going to be ready to go to trial. I mean, it, it's like it, there's so much. There's so much to be done. And, you know, they, they just got back on this case in, in January, and – you know, the first month they didn't have the discovery or whenever the hell they got the discovery back and then they had to re go through it all. And there's just so much. I mean, they're, they're putting forth. We know they're putting forth an alternate suspect defense, which requires investigation. And, and beyond that, we know that there's the, the phone data that has to be examined by experts. And, and we know that they've been stonewalled with with funds to get those things done. It's like. I don't know. You know, it's like, well, you and I had the same discussion with, you know, we, we obviously contemplated in Garcia whether or not to go with the speedy trial because we didn't want to give the, the state three years to dig around and do right. all the shit that they were doing, you know, which ultimately ended up we did give them. And in the meantime, our client sat and sag for, for 23 hours a day was, you know, and when people crazy. are like, oh, how many times do you bring up Garcia? Well, I, we bring up Garcia because it's like almost identical to this case. Yep. Like, he, factually, he it's psychosis. like it's so similar. It, it, it's it's eerie almost. It's it's like, frankly, the closest case that I can think of all the way to Allison getting booted because she was papering them to death. And there, that was a death penalty case. And there, you know, we appeal, we did it. Like, it, it's just, it, it mirrors this case in so many ways, procedurally, not necessarily factually. And, and that's what we talk about on this channel. We talk about the procedural things. When the trial comes, that's when I'll talk about the factual things. That, that's when I'll talk about what's going on at trial, you know? Right. So it, to answer your until, question, yeah. as soon as they filed the motions that deal with the the discovery issues i was like oh no 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 this is they're not they're not ready to go to trial they should not be going to trial even if they think that obviously they we don't know what they know and again i know bob has said it but he is uh not associated with the defense and knows nothing about the defense and you know doesn't communicate with the uh, baldwin and rossi about this case. And so we don't know anything that anyone else doesn't know, but even if they think that they've got a slam dunk, like whatever they're planning on doing. And to be perfectly honest, I kind of fear we've seen most of what they've got. Like I, I don't see much holding back, but maybe there are a couple things that are being held back. Um, when those motions got filed, I was like, Oh no, 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 they're, they're not, they are not ready. Um, because I think if they had, you know, the evidence, you know, for example, the GPS data from the girls' phones and all the other data from their phones and from his phones, that they'd probably, just considering what they have put in their Frank's motions, they probably would have put something in there. Like, well, the evidence shows he was searching for the stocks, like he said he was from one o'clock to one thirteen, And at one thirteen and 20 seconds, he walked 20 feet. I mean, we know that that's all the kind of data that you can get. We saw it in Murdoch. I mean, he turned his phone and he was standing right here at, you know, two twelve when he turned his phone upright, the phone tried to take a picture that could at, you know, three minutes later, and he was standing four feet further. I mean, so that that is out there, you know, uh, but it, I mean, it's not the, the defense's the problem, job. Like, but we don't know. It it's a small town, you know. I like I, I they have one, maybe two towers. I I don't know how accurate the you know the geolocation could be. I don't know how they can triangulate. I, like one well, tower might cover the whole can't town. Use, 
those people can't use find my iPhone and find their phones. Those people, my, when my daughter gets in the cul-de-sac, I get a, I get a message. Scarlet Tom. Right. I mean, your phone itself is going to do some of it, but I understand what you're saying. Like it might, it might have to do with how many, how many towers are in the area in order to accomplish Well, some that. of it's so satellite, you know, G right. global positioning satellite GPS is different than the, than the towers. So, I mean, when we go through um, the state's response, wherein they, you know, they attack the geolocation stuff and the geofencing stuff. Uh, Joe Jackalone uh, gave me a contact of a uh, geofencing expert who's law enforcement, who I've reached out to, who uh, I'm going to try to coordinate to have him on um, because I, I don't I don't know jack shit about geofencing and I'm not going to pretend like I do, um, you know, beyond what like a basic description of it is, you know, well, but you and I you like. And maybe I should just save it till the time when we go over their motion, actually. So maybe I'll just do that. Well, I mean, I you don't want to forget it. Well, I, there's no way I can because it's like a screaming thing in the in the state's response. I'm like, well, in that county, good luck for the state to ever try and use GPS triangulation, all of that, and say and rely on it even for probable cause because he said. There is absolutely zero reliability in any of that. And that the person, any person could be standing anywhere in Delphi and they can't determine where. So, right. I mean, that's something that law enforcement uses all the time in search warrant affidavits, in warrants, you know, all kinds of warrants and to arrest and to convict that they were located at a certain spot at a certain time. Those of you who were with us today for our coverage of the the Chad Daybell, you know, they were like, okay, well, the brother, Alex, at whatever time it was, 2.12 p.m., was a 1,000 feet from Chad Daybell's house. Did the, but the phone never went to Chad Daybell's house. We don't believe the phone ever went to Chad Daybell's house. It doesn't mean he didn't leave it behind. It's what the officer said. But they know when Chad's in his backyard. They know when Alex is on Chad's property. That's out, you know. It's just, you know, so. Yeah, I know. Um, For those right, so, reasons, I don't think they're ready. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very nervous about it. You know, on, on both sides of it. <laughs> Like, I, I just don't, you know, it, it's such a huge trial with so much. Um, and I, I've been telling people for months, I'm like, you, you just, again, remember when we started, it was what, 65 days, we're a month out now. And that month went for, for us, not trying the case, went in the blink of an eye. I realize I'm old and time moves faster for me. But when you are preparing for a case like this, McClelland and Rosie and Baldwin are going to wake up and it's going to be the eve of trial, like in the blink of an eye, like they're running around trying to do depositions. You know, they're, they're trying to secure experts. They're trying to have the experts examine the things that they need examined. They have to gain an understanding of the science behind whatever they have the experts evaluating. It, it's so, so much that it, it's like, you know, it cannot be a pride thing with with Baldwin and Rosie. They they can't worry if if the general public's going to be like, oh, see, I told no, I you think, these fucking. I outside. think that's you know? their worry right there. I think what what is it? QB I think that's a legitimate said? worry. I think, I think that that's a, I worry. think that's a huge worry. But I mean, you can't. But risk. I have to say, right? It's it's a it's a double edged sword. Like, what, what, right. like and again, do do? we don't do you, know everything like, they've done. They, they may have right, all this exactly. stuff. But How I will they? say, I, right, but I will say, based on the filings, all of the filings and all the motions, even the, the most recent ones, the ones we haven't done yet and the ones we have done, it seems to me they don't know everything they have. You mean they, in terms of the discovery? Right. They're, oh, yeah. they're looking for things that it seems the state said that they've turned over. You know, and they're right. I think there was some comment about things getting dumped in no specific organized, you know, fashion. And 
we have, and it doesn't matter what case, but we've come up against that. And, you know, then we're asking for the, the police evidence log. They've got a log that they keep who went in, what lockers and where and what's and what and who took it and when, just uh, separate from all the, you know, uh, the receipts for um, my mind's not working when you're tracking discovery. What do you mean? Hello? I'm listening. What do you mean when you're tracking it's, discovery? Uh, my brain just died. Like when things exchange hands, the chain of custody. Sorry, people. So, <laughs> you know, over and above just like chain of custody paperwork. We're talking about, you know, I it they did an interview of this one. The CD is labeled EV number, whatever. Now we've gotten discovery from Indiana, but it wasn't labeled by Indiana. So, I, but my understanding is that typically that's how they get evidence. And if they're just getting plopped, completely disorganized evidence with like a list of what's there, it's, it's, you know, it's very difficult. And it's also very possible that they've missed something. And it does definitely seem to me that based on their, at least what they've said in their own pleadings, that, uh, you know, that there's things that they don't know that they have. And before I highlighted this, I highlighted another question or comment that somebody made. And now I don't remember what it, what it was, but, um, you know, so, I mean, obviously we would hope that, that, you know, like being, not being like, I'm not going to do what everybody keeps saying I was going to do. Oh, we just demanded trial for no reason. We know we can't do it. Like I, I would hope, you know, that that's not playing into anybody's, anybody's uh, mind. Well, I mean, at and this point, like, like nobody can think it was a move. Like you, you right. like you do not play chicken in a right. case like this because every day that passes and that you get closer to trial, the it's less likely it is that the, it, right. The judges could be like, go pound sand. Right. <laughs> like you should have asked for the continuance. Went out and, Right. Like right. we're like this, this train has left the station, gentlemen. Sorry. Um, right. So I agree. I don't trial. think even if some like fringe people are like, ah, oh, Taja, they did it on purpose. No one who understands the law, no one who's tried a case would actually think that that was like their intended intended goal or, or, you know, you, you, you wouldn't wait till this close to, you know, yeah, it's like something. this just isn't the circumstance where you're using a speedy as a is a is a sword to, where you're trying to get something done or you're you know, if you're trying to get the state to to move on a better plea deal or a plea deal or an offer like that, like we're like this isn't that like anybody think who thinks confident, that these guys like are super confident in their case, but that they're not realizing there might be other stuff there that's going to, you know, that, that that maybe isn't like your defense, but actually proves reasonable doubt, you know, like, well, I mean, that's the thing. Like we never, like, I mean, you more than anyone I know abhors relying on just hoping that they can't meet their burden, <laughs> you know, that like, right. that is for a defense attorney. It's the absolute scariest proposition. Like, okay, I, like we're going to go forward with the trial and we're just going to hope that they can't make their case. You know, we're going to attack their witnesses enough on cross to, to make sure that there's reasonable doubt. That is the worst and scariest strategy that exists from a defense attorney's perspective. I mean, we know, that they have these alternate suspects that they want to be able to, to put up like basically their own case in chief on where they're saying that these are the guys, it's not that guy, it's these guys, you know, or and, could and be these whether or guys, not the state is going to turn around and say, you know, or it could be these guys. Well, I mean, Elvis fields confessed. I mean, like, I like, like, is that as useless as, is RAs? I don't know. Like he wasn't being coerced when he said it, you know, are these pictures going to match up? Are the crime scene photos going to match up to what he said about the, the sticks looking like a crown or, or antlers? I, I don't know, but I mean, right. if they do, it's pretty compelling. I mean, how does he know that? Right. You know, I mean, like, it's like how would he know that? But for being there, it it's like, talk about that at the hearing. Did they bring yeah. that up at all? 
He talked about yeah. the antlers. Yeah. He talked about the whole Elvis Fields confession thing, or you know, when he turns around and asks the question. I think it was to Murphy. Right. Um, and so Bob I and I, I mean, just... are by no means saying that Odinists murdered these two little girls. All we're saying is it does seem like there's evidence that wasn't followed up on and that there's there's something else to this. And, you know, we were talking about it, you know, like earlier. And I guess we'll probably get into it more when we do the the response and the reply, because I was very underwhelmed by the defense's reply to the to the state's response. But um, and some other issues. But, you know like in the eighties when they're talking about, well, there's never been any actual evidence of a, um, what am I thinking of, babe? What? Like I a, I can't, a, a satanic, you know, killing like a ritualistic. Oh, like a san satanic a satanic, killing. Yeah. Right. right. So let's use like Satanism or I'm just going to say Wiccan just to, like witchcraft just to make like an obvious thing. So you have the scene and there's like a big cauldron there and there's some, you know, old raggedy broom there and like a not correct Pentagon, you know, like, well, the eyes of the newt. Right. Yeah. There's some, there's some yeah. frogs and a thing. People will be like, well, this is not a Wiccan ritual. This is not even like, and again, I'm not trying to be factual. here. I am Wiccan. Like, there's no way that that's a Wiccan ritual. Right. I mean, like, kind right. of what people and, are and saying. And I'm just trying to say, like, a, a, a witchcraft kind of thing. There's something. I'm not trying to be real here. But that, but it's obviously done by someone who's got some knowledge. Either they kind of like witchcraft, and this is their way of playing it out. But it wouldn't be an official, you know, ritualistic witchcraft ritual sorry a witchcraft ritual it'd just be someone who's got some knowledge or might even like or same with satanic stuff you've got people who kind of like satan and like the whole satanic principles but it's not an official satanic ritual it's just some schmo who likes to flaunt that he believes in satan who's acting a fool you know, I wouldn't say acting a fool if, if I'm talking about murder, but, uh, you know, there's been lots of, you know, things that happen where kids go in a place and they destroy an old house and like spray a Pentagon or whatever the case may be. You know, they don't. I mean, my, my whole thing with the, the concept of like my biggest problem with like the Odinist concept is, is like, what is the motive? Why Abby and Libby? You know, it's like. And right. I know that the state or the defense in their memo, their concept was that, you know, Lib Libby's mom dated outside of her race and that it was done as some kind of, you know, revenge or, you know, some kind of message, uh, you know, that, that, you know, like. In my opinion. I, know, like, I, I mean, that's the hardest thing for me to get over. Like in, in the this way case, I think like of in it general. Is, is sort of like, let's assume the the uh ruins are actual ruins that are used runes just runes, runes sorry yeah. runes yeah. like right. ritualistic you know runes are you know have some odinistic thing to them i the way i've been thinking of this is that it seems possible that whoever committed the offense is someone who has you know, like enjoy, like believes in Odinism or, you know, has some fascination with Odinism. Not that it's like an official accepted, you know, documented Odinistic ritual, because I guess based on, you know, like to be a ritual, it has to be something that is like part of the actual religion, which obviously this wouldn't be, but that whoever did this, you know, wanted to sacrifice a human being or wanted to kill a human being and also has an affiliate, you know, like uh, some sort of interest in Odinism or runes or whatever the case, you know, whatever the case may be. I, I, I but Cause 22 years was enough for me. That's why mischief. Bob can like, absolutely uh, I, practice law. 
yeah i'm like i'm still active in illinois yeah. I, it's it's my choice i chose three years you ago wanted, to start a podcast you That's, wanted to write you know, tw 22 years of all the things that i'm whining about about how hard it is and how it's gut punch after gut punch after gut punch for 20 years going against the state it gets tiring you know yeah you lose steam it just does you you lose and, and you can't be in a position as a criminal defense attorney to to not have the fervor to not have the desire to do it to to like lose the wind in your sails for the fight it's it's too much and you're you're not you're not doing the job for your clients because i mean you can't be in that position so you know i mean I, like I, I put my time in that's the short answer um you know so as far as and, and i and i like what i'm doing i, I like right. telling stories i like going through you know old cases i like going through new cases i, I like the advocacy when work i'm doing with with bill doors trying to find additional gacy victims and we think we know where they are you know like like I, i'm out there doing real shit. i'm not just sitting behind a mic talking shit. you know that's that's not what i'm about um and, and just to address the 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 elephant in the room if y'all were expecting a hit piece from us we're not doing it that's not what i do it's not what Allison does. We have no interest in doing it, you know, in terms of addressing certain things that were said by certain people. Uh, I'm absolutely not a part of themselves. the, let me just, let me just spit oh, this out. Like uh, I'm absolutely not a part of the defense team in any way, shape or form. I'm not a spokesperson paid or unpaid. I'm merely a member of the defense bar. Who's absolutely disgusted by what I see in this case. And if you don't understand that, then you don't watch my content. And if you don't watch my content, then you probably shouldn't talk about it. Cherry picking Twitter accounts and, and you know, picking a thing or two off, a, a, you know, a live that you may have watched is not understanding what our content is. The only thing that I gleaned from that transcript uh, was that you don't know anything about me or what I stand for. That's the only thing that I know. Um, so as far as my relationship with Carol Winicky and Dave Hennessy, they're friends of mine, period. And well, I have I every do ability. Wanna... You Sorry, say I did want to. I did want to comment that the whole thing with Hennessy was that Hennessy contacted Bob. I only know this because Bob was in the shower when the email came through or whatever happened for Bob to sort of have his back and bringing out the truth because there was a podcast out there who misquoted him and also said that he was intentionally s speaking so loud so that all the people in the courtroom could hear him, like kind of get out things that were beneficial to the defense or to say whatever it was he was saying. So the contact with Bob was like, well, I was having that conversation with you because they were sitting next to each other. And did I say those things? Well, you have my back that I didn't. And plus I have hearing issues. I am hearing impaired. That's why I was speaking so loudly. So there's how those two, you know, started talking. As far as, you know, Kara, there were, again, so many of the defense bar reaching out, you know, trying to get involved, wanting to say things. I, I personally had positions on, you know, what arguments they might want to raise. And, you know, I communicated that to her. They said that they. And there's nothing it. wrong with that. We don't need to right. apologize to anybody ever. We are right. defense bar lawyers. And I resent the fact that anybody's calling me ethically dubious. Well, that's if you don't have the, like, you know, like, 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 I, I, like but, I'm not going to get me, into this with them, but like, I right. just want to address the, the few things I've addressed. I'm in no way, shape or form uh, on the defense team at all. My communications with Hennessy and, and, and Winicky are, are merely strategical in terms of the, the, the two of us. We talk to Kara all the time. She's a friend of ours. Right. And there's nothing about wrong with it. Attorneys, the, uh, attorneys that actually try cases and practice criminal law talk to each other in cases like this. That's just how it goes. You know, we, we throw ideas. Like Allison was researching tonight as soon as she read the memo. Like she was on the computer pulling up cases saying on the phone with Kara talking about man or like, the, oh, should Lord. they have raised this? Should they have raised that? 
I mean, like, right, and that's, that's just what us two do. talking. She's not involved in right. that part of this. <laughs> She's not, you know, it's like they are hey, not a part of the defense team. Did period. You see this? No, I'm just kidding. Um, I don't, dude. I but, don't, and like, also, I could care less. Like, what? Honestly, like, like what? I'm addressing the things that I wanted to address as no, far I, as I talking about that. Oh, as far as the hashtag, we agree. We agree. If it could be construed as hurtful to the families in any way, shape or form, which we didn't view it that way. Every case on Twitter always has justice for whoever the case is about. I, I wasn't viewing it as anything other than the only way that justice is truly served in this case is if they get the right person or persons. The same thing that we say on every live. And if there's a fair trial, because that right, way... So the families don't have to sit through a second trial or more and go through that nightmare. That's it. And, and as soon as, as my good, beautiful, wonderful, loving friend, Jason Usri, Usri is like, look, man, you and know, it, that it's a bad. That. <laughs> Who did? When you first told me, I did. I was like, well, maybe that hashtag doesn't make you know, as much sense. Yeah, but, you know, it's like, like I, I didn't realize that, like, the family had created it and you know people are like we well, can't right. have ownership of a hashtag well that may be true but if it's their thing and they started it, I, like i am not and you and i are not in a position to want to pile on to their grief no. so it's that's a very easy thing for me not to use it period that's it there's no big nefarious thing going on with me i didn't create the hashtag i used it like i use hashtags on the dozens of other cases that we cover like you have to understand that Delphi is not the only case we cover. We're currently covering Chad Daybell's trial. I, I was covering the, the Nikolai Mew case. Like anything I find interesting, I cover. I, I'm going to be covering, like I'm, I'm pivoting from, from Daybell and I'm 100% covering the, the other most toxic case on the internet, which is Karen Reed when that goes to trial next week because that case is the only other case that I've ever seen. And both of them happen to be the most toxic cases on the planet because in both of those cases, it just so happens that the defense decided to put their theory of the case out to the public before trial. So you have Delphi and you have Karen Reed. Think about that. Those are the two cases that we know of where both the theory from the state and the both the theory from the defense are out in the public and look and look at what it creates. Right. And I'm okay with it because it evens the I've, I've said it a million times. And and when Allison and I cover those two motions, um, the re, the response by the state and uh the reply yeah. by the defense uh as to the Franks hearing, we're also going to be covering that hearing from uh the Koberger case that took place last night uh regarding the uh the survey that was done. Uh, because it's fascinating and, and and it vindicated me in terms of what I've been trying to tell you all about the way that defense attorneys feel about the fact that probable cause affidavits are what sit out in the public sometimes for years unchecked as the only thing out there, which is incredibly prejudicial to all defendants in all the cases like there, 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 there is no other way around it. That's why when when the Frank's memo dropped, I was thrilled. Not because what it said, because they were getting their theory of the case out there. It was the first time I had seen that, that I can remember where a full defense theory is out there to, to balance out the state's theory, because it's nothing more than that. That's why they have trials. The state's thing could be completely torn apart at trial, and the defense's theory can, can be completely destroyed at trial. I have no idea. That's the entire purpose of a trial. But leading into that trial, I hate having to vore dire witnesses or potential jurors, rather, that have already reached a conclusion because they've been reading a probable cause affidavit or listening to the media that's reporting on the probable cause affidavit or the facts that the state has put out for years leading up to a case. That's like it's it's like they're making an already near impossible job more impossible by doing that. So it's like. Like those two cases in particular, that's why these two communities, like if you look at that thing, it's just as ugly as Delphi. Like the Karen Reed thing is, is it may even be more toxic because in that case, they flat out came and said that, you know, this is a bunch of cops that did this 
and you know they they've got cops that are working for them and the DA's working for them and they're trying to cover this thing up they came flat out and said it there here it's it's not like it's not even close to that in terms of you know they're just talking about incompetence in Delphi there they're talking about straight straight corruption where law enforcement's trying to to change the narrative in order to protect other cops it's and if you're not familiar with that case it's just as ugly on the in the social media world as this case is if not more and you know and i'm here for it and i can't wait to jump into that trial when it starts because to me it's an unbelievable case so and at and least as far as commenting go ahead sorry yeah like, i mean you're you're allowed to jump in but i like just let me rant this shit out i mean if they were talking about you which they're lucky that they weren't because I get very defensive when anybody attacks my wife. Um, you know, but as far as it, I didn't set up the fundraiser, I had nothing, nothing to do. To I didn't do even it. know it was getting set up until it was out in the oh. world. The only thing that I did is suggest to them, Hey, maybe you might want to take the language where they're declaring Richard Allen innocent out of it. Because I think that that's going to set uh, like an ugly tone. People that think that Richard Allen is innocent are already going to, they're already going to donate to it. What what they were looking for, what the defense needs is the people that are, are concerned about fair trials and the constitutional rights of defendants in this country. Those are the folks that, that you want to, to get in and to come in or, or people that may not even feel like that initially. So I suggested that they change the language. And I, and I, and I wrote a paragraph to him, like, maybe you want to put this in there. As far as anything else that was added afterwards, I had nothing to do with that either. So I didn't have anything to, with putting it together. I didn't have anything with starting it. That's what, that, that was a, my thing. So sorry, wrong again. Um, I don't know what else there was, but like, as far as, you know, like, like I've never said a, like an ugly word about anybody. And if you can show me something, in, in any of my lives or any of my tweets where I have, I'll, I'll own it. Just like when I make mistakes, like I made a mistake the night of the hearing. And I said that, that the Messer thing was a, a, a girl that they kidnapped. I owned it as soon as I realized that I made it. That wasn't me trying to put a narrative out there. That was me being up since 4.30 in the morning or earlier, walking over the courthouse, sitting in there all day, writing notes probably being too exhausted to have done a live and getting sloppy period end of conversation. That's why I didn't go live again that night. Otherwise I would have corrected it because later that night I was going to actually read through the notes. So it's that simple. When I, when I fuck up, I own it always. So, you know, like, like anybody who's going to put a, a hit piece out on me, they're dead to me, which is a shame because I have a lot of wonderful friends in the podcast community, which is what, I am first and foremost a podcaster. I've got a pretty fucking good podcast, and if you haven't if you haven't checked it out, you should. Um, yes. And and I'm just facts. And if I screw up facts, I, I am immediate to rectify them as soon as I'm made aware that I made a mistake. So that's it. That's all I'm going to say. I'm not going to say anything else about anybody. I'm not going to attack anybody. You know, if I believe that people are making mistakes in their content, I'll note it. That's not personal attacks. That's me attacking certain things that I feel that were misrepresented by people. And, and that's it. And that's, and that's all I have to say about it. That's all I'll ever have to say about it. If you were hoping for more, sorry to disappoint, but it's not my game. I just, I don't have the energy, the time or the desire to do any of that. It's just not what I do because I don't care about that. I, I care about, I care about covering the cases that I care that I cover with integrity and, and trying to stick with facts and trying to teach you all something because what I feel like what Allison and I give you that no one else in this, in this entire uh, genre gives you uh, aside from women like Susan, um, you know, who I just absolutely love, you know, her and Jacinda with proof, you know, if you have defense attorneys out there trying to teach you about what we do, I, I think we bring value to this community. I just do. And, and I hope that you all feel that way because, you know, that's what our intent is. Our intent is to try to help you understand, to try to answer questions, to try to shed light on it, on what we really do is in this profession. And, and I think that over the past two and a half going on three years that we've done that, I think that we bring real value to this community. I'm not so sure about other people out there. 
what value they bring, you know? Um, and I'm not talking about anybody in particular. I just, I right. just know in the, in, that we in, bring in, value, like, right. like tangible value that, that, that people are learning things from us. I'm not speaking on things that I don't know anything about. You know, I'll, I'll bring an expert on our show to talk about something I don't know anything about, just like I did it, it you know, in my practice, in my career. So, I mean, that that's just it. like we did in the Lori, uh, just like we did in the Lori Vallow uh, stuff where I was calling the Church of Latter-day Saints and, you know, learning whatever I could about the 144,000 and the biblical or Mormon references and, you know, and, and that kind of thing. Yeah. And so you know, we're like, like I kind of said before, we're, we're sort of used to it. We're used to getting the shit end of the deal. Judges assuming the prosecutors in, in any given case are being more forthcoming than the defense attorneys are. And, you know, I, I know I've told the, the, the story before where, you know, we were on a pretty big trial and the judge screamed and yelled at, at me if I couldn't prove the point that I was making. He was going to go to the ARDC. He's going to this. He was going to that. It's the same judge that kind of questioned our integrity um, earlier. And then at the end of the trial, of course, by then an empty courtroom, but he said we're a credit to the defense bar and there should be more lawyers like us. And thank you so much. And, you know, that kind of thing. So we're we're used to it. And that's why I sort of said going into this, if we just wanted to get more viewers and to have everybody love us, we would not be taking a defense position on things because you know, we've we've been there our whole lives. We know what we know what people think and what people feel. People people love to hate defense attorneys. Like it, it's way harder to be on this side of it. But you know, I mean, we went in. When I originally started this, the, the podcast, I told Allison, I said, I don't think I'm going to touch the lawyer thing with the 10 foot pole. And she's like, are you out of your fucking mind? She's like, that's what you do. Like, that's what your value is. That's what you can bring. That's what separates you from, from everybody else in, in the true crime world. You know I mean? Like it, you're a voice that's underserved and, and like, no one is out there doing what you do. And I realized it within five minutes that she was absolutely right. And that, that I had to lean into it. Now, when I'm covering cases where like, I don't see anything that's obscene, like I do in Delphi, then I'm, I'm very unbiased in terms of like, I, like I, I sit there and treat it to be as objective and in, even as defense sided as we are on Delphi, if Allison and I have issues with filings like you've seen tonight and on many other of our lives, if, if I see issues or if I'm concerned about something that the defense is doing or should have done, we say it like to act like, well, like I, I, I'm giving a, a, a biased but objective viewpoint of what I think is going on in this case, because that's all we can do. I mean, that, that's that's what we think we bring to the table. You know, I mean, again, at the end of the day, I mean, that's what our value is, you know, beyond that. I mean, what, what else am I? Otherwise I'm just another one of the masses just talking about true crime. I mean, I think that that's what separates you and I, I mean, you're, you're brilliant. Like people love hearing you explain shit, you know, mm -hmm. and, and then when you explain it, I try to break it down so that people can understand what you just said, you know, because you're, you're one of those attorneys that talks in attorney speak, you know, and I, I'm an attorney that can, speak in human speak because you know most people don't talk lawyer ease you know and in in legally so it's like like that's that's why we're a great pairing I, I love when um you know obviously i i i know what you're talking about but i love having you you just break it down for people and then i translate that's that's what our shtick is you know and and, and we're never going to change that so um you know and, and as far as this case goes believe me like there, not a thing has changed. The the way that we cover this, we'll be covering it the exact same way all the way up into trial. And then when trial starts, you could be guaranteed. I want to be sitting there. I'll be doing the best that I can to take as diligent of notes as I can. And I'm going to give you all the straight dope when I come out. Good, bad, and or that's ugly. When we'll have matter. an opinion on guilt or innocence. Facts. And that's when we'll actually have an opinion on guilt or innocence. When we're exactly. <laughs> I have no I, I have no clue whether or not Richard Allen is guilty of this crime because I don't know anything about the evidence other than what we've seen thus far. 
And if anybody knows different, you know, on the other side of it, well, you know, maybe you're the ones who've gotten leaks. I don't know. Like, I, but where I'm at right now, like I, I am in the position that every one of us should be in, which is we have to wait till trial and let's see what they got. Let's see what they have. Let's see what evidence they have. So, you know, that's it. I'm done. I'm, I'm over. <laughs> I'm over this for the night. So, so got, living like, free so, in Texas, I'm going to just keep you done. If, if gold denies, can they go to superior court? No, they, they've got to wait until the end of trial for, for something like losing a motion to suppress or something like that. They've got to go through it all because the court assumes that you don't need to start clogging up the appellate system unless you get found guilty. So you've got to, you've got to wait. Um, you've got to wait to the end. Um, I was just seeing if there was like another question question before we get to. Yeah, I think we're, we all sort of, uh, we all sort of feel helpless. And I think, I mean, at this point, the major harm, the major harm, well, I guess there were really two major harms that got Bob really going and sort of, shifted his his view on this and that was the fact that Richard Allen remains in prison under such harsh conditions and how is he going to be mentally able to assist in his own defense and then the other thing that also got attorneys from all over the country paying attention and you know um chiming in is that their lawyers were getting removed so at least their lawyers are you know on the case. And really all we can do at this point is hope that the system does, you know, what it's supposed to do when you, when you actually have two sides, you know, adversarial positions pre presenting evidence and challenging evidence. And, you know, if, if the evidence is there at trial, I'm not going to be shy about saying, I think Richard Allen did it. If there's more, <laughs> you know, more out there. No question. Like if, if I'm going to remain if Richard outraged, Allen, if they show Richard Allen is guilty, I will be the first one to say, thank God they got the right guy. <laughs> like, like that's what people just don't get about this thing. Like, like they're, they're confusing our, our desire to have every defendant, including Richard Allen have a fair trial because it, it, it benefits everybody in every single way. And with, with us believing that he's innocent. I, I don't know. Do I, do I think that what I've seen, I, I, I mean, I don't know how many times I have to say this before it sticks. I believe in what I've seen that they have a long way to go to prove beyond a reasonable doubt to me that he's guilty, but guess what? I'm not sitting on the jury that, that, you know, but in, in my estimation, they have a long way to go in terms of what I've seen in order to prove to me that he's the guy. Now, if these confessions, the ones that they don't talk about, if he's, if he's giving details, then he's clearly the dude. Right. I mean, I've just said personally, I'm not considering there to be any confessions until I hear them just because I, we can't. So that's why I haven't been taking them into consideration in my, you know, in my mind at all. But again, I, I've also been just as Bob has very clear that Nanook's unhappy, very clear that I have, that I, you know, have no opinion on Richard Allen's guilt or innocence at this point, because, you know, I just, I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know what I don't know evidence wise. Um, and there was something else I was going to say, but then I did get distracted. Of whatever the hell is getting the dog all, all worked up right Something now. Something like a squirrel. Somebody walking. Is he outside or he's just, looking out the window inside no he was just he was just giving me kisses he was he's inside he was giving me well, you all walked the, away all i didn't know if you ran the... down and put him out no uh -uh. no I, I went to let him in he was scratching at the door all right um okay so i think that's it for tonight y'all uh okay so i'm just going to give a warning now we're about to thank all the people that have generously given us money or generously donated so 
for the people that hate that part, you may want to drop off the live now because now I'm going to do what we always will do for for the end of time. I'm all, like, we're always going to thank people that are generous to us. It's not me begging for money. It's me just thanking people for their kindness. I don't think it, it reflects on my professionalism at all. All right. I think that we're doing Let this. It go. Whatever, <laughs> dude, that, 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 that one, that Reddit post I just really wanna, got under my skin. I just want to comment to Christy Moreno that obviously what your, you know, your comment here, this seems like cruel and unusual punishment akin to torture. Even how can this be happening to a man who has not been to trial yet? That clearly there are a lot of people who, you know, hold that same opinion, which is a lot of what's driving people who are interpreting people who, who take that stance as you're, you're a defense person. You're, you know, like supporting Richard Allen. You're not. And, and I don't know, maybe you do more than this comment says, but all I take from this comment is that you don't like that someone who is innocent until proven guilty, innocent until proven guilty, is being kept in such conditions that he's deteriorated to the extent that this guy has. And, you know, obviously we, you know, agree it shouldn't be happening. I'm still like today, I'm still like, well, maybe if they file it now, they can get him moved, you know, at least for the for the next month. So maybe he can get a little bit better before trial, because I can tell you from personal. I have to tell you not to interrupt you, but like I said, like after the last hearing, he, he seemed better to me. Like he, he looked better. Like his eyes looked better. Like I was saying, he was making like eye contact with his wife that like made sense. It wasn't like the thousand yard stare. You know what I mean? It was like he was making appropriate facial movements, you know, like, like I think he's in a better place mentally for certain than he was six, eight, eight months yeah. ago, you know, before when they, they moved, turn the lights you know? off and wouldn't let him sleep and harassed right. him. Yeah. All right. Sure. Do your thing. Do your thanks. All right. So again, uh, if you hate the thank yous, now is the time to jump off the live because that's happening. Um, Jennifer J25, member for six months. Thank you so much. Excellent job on the live today. I'm assuming you're talking about our Chad Daybell coverage. Us or and Jay um, and Allie were all, and Shans jumped in, right? You and Shans yep, took and the, the late morning shift. You guys crushed it. Thank you so much for being a member. Uh, we love all our members. Uh, you guys mean everything to us. Craig Nugent, $20 hollow. Appreciate Greg. you so much for that. And oh, Greg, right. Greg Nugent. Apologies. Thank you for that. Um, thank you for your generous support. We really appreciate it. Champagne Poppy, uh, Ahmad. So first and foremost, I want to thank you for that. And I want to thank all of our mods for being here tonight and for everything that you do every time we're live. You guys are everything. I need mods on our socials i need mods in my facebook group because i never go in there because yeah, apparently like, we're allowing people to say horrible things so i don't know apparently you know apparently. like like and, and i think i think kasha might be the only mod in there i don't know kasha you have to let me know i've, I've tried to get other mods in there um because I, I just i'm not as active in facebook because facebook kind of disgusts me like like whenever i post something in there it gets like like it, it, like it, it, the reach is like 12 for like the person who like owns the group. Like no one sees my post. Like I, I've given up hope with the Facebook group. So I just, I, I have it exist there. And, and I like the community in there as long as they're playing nice. The only thing I ever post is there it is like admonishing people not to talk shit about other, other creators. See how that worked out for me. Um, so thank you, Champagne Poppy. Uh, meow, Zendong. I love that. Uh, $50 hollow. Wow. Thank you so much for that. What is happening to Richard Allen is absolutely unconscionable. Thank you for everything that you're doing. Thank you. And thank you for recognizing that we're just trying to make sure that, that people's civil liberties and constitutional rights are being upheld because it matters for all of us, not just the defendants. It's, it's a much bigger issue than that. Did you put that up? I did. Jersey John. <laughs> You're going out of order. Oh, did we no. do those questions? Yes. Oh yeah. You did that one. You did that one. 
Jersey Jen, two dollar holla. Thank you so much for your continued support. You're you're wonderful. I know uh, I love when you're you're in with Jay and I. Um, I know you're part of the fam, so thank you for being there for uh, with us at all time. The great Nate's uh, uh, Ned Smith, you know we love you, man. Thank you. Ah, uh, family hug. You for you're gifting on the another. Wrong. Oh, Ned. I don't know sorry, how... I'm I'm trying to go fast. Uh, appreciate you, brother, and I'm sure that the member who got that gifted that membership is appreciative too. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Sierra Lamaster, five dollar holla. Allie and Bob, thank you always. My go to channel, love from West Virginia. Thank you so much, Sierra. We really appreciate thank your you. support and the kind words. Thank you so much, Greg Nugent. Back again for a two dollar holla. Ooh. Thank you. Appreciate that, Greg. Um. We answered if gold that. denies, can they immediately go to superior court? Denies what? This I, I this particular responded motion. To it. I res okay. we did All this. Right, I always make sure I answer like questions like that. Okay, Amanda the ten dollar hollow. Appreciate you, girl. Thank you so much. You're an always giver. Uh, we are so appreciative of you being here. And hanging with us all the time. We, we really do. It means the world to us. Alpha She Wolf. Her, love that. As a former CEO in jail RN, I'm horrified by this. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. Thank you for, for recognizing that something is off about the way this is going down there. It's like, it's not right. <laughs> it's not right. Um, so thank you for, for being a member and a member of the fam. We really appreciate it. Uh, Kasha, thank you so much. Gifting five glorious Defense Diary memberships. And thank you so much for everything that you do. I, I, I feel like, and you have to text me and let me know, uh, like, if, if you are, like I, like, I honestly don't know if you're the only mod in the Facebook thing. If you are, that's not fair to you. And I need to get other mods in there to help you because, like, I don't want you getting stuck with that at all. Um, so let me know about that. Um, so, and thank you. And I'm sure the other members thank you as well. Jen, appreciate you. Another mod, $5 sticker. super sticker. Appreciate you all day. Greeny, aw, family hug. Welcome to the family, <laughs> Greeny. Love having you here. And I love that name, Greeny. And <laughs> and the thing's Greeny. That's, <laughs> it's green. It's all green. Uh, Persephone Applewood, you know we adore you. You're a longtime member of the fam. Thank you so much for your generosity means the, the world to us. We really appreciate it. Dr. Vonna K, you know, I love you. Dr. Vonna is like trying to supply us with lots of great stuff, which Dr. Vonna, we will be using. I just want to compile it. Um, she's super bright and she's sending us lots of really interesting things, especially like we're getting into the stuff that she, that is her jam like with the confessions, the false confessions, the psychology of it and all that stuff. So thank you not only for that $10, but for taking the time um, to do what you're doing outside of this and, and for forwarding and trying to get the word out to me. Uh, I really, really appreciate that so much. Uh, and I value you being a part of the community. So thank you for that. Um, well, and Ted Bundy was treated better than RA. Wait, wait a minute. I well, appreciate that. And is so the doctor's a she- uh, it, it shouldn't matter. Yes, the doctor, Dr. Vonda is a she. Okay, that the doctor, you know, he actually appreciates uh, citations. and. <laughs> oh, the only reason there. I didn't read that, babe, is because you had read it during the live. I saw you. Or I, pu I put it up there. I didn't actually read it. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Sorry. There you go. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Vonda, for another $2 holler. Ted Bundy was treated better than RA. Uh, yeah, that's let's, uh, let's, it's not good. Ah, Kate Civil Right investigator is that what you think that is inv yeah i love that thank you so much for your support kate 20 dollar holla appreciate you so much thank you for being here and supporting looks like rights. uh yeah i mean i mean i'm huge for that like I, I i love that that's what you're about so i mean obviously that's important to us um don burke always give her ten dollar defense diary podcast memberships Thank you for always being there for us, for always supporting us, Dawn. You're amazing. You're an amazing human. And I'm sure that those 10 lucky members who got gifted memberships are very thankful to you as well. Uh, Dr. Vonda, another $2 holla. Travis mentioned Stanford Prison Experiment by uh, Zimbardo. I know that. I, I watched that doc. It was, yeah. it was a, a crazy documentary. Um, I remember that. And that's, uh, I mean, Travis knows. I'm assuming Travis was in here tonight. I mean, I just. So I are we Travis. talking about that in relation to like the 
I mean, uh, Travis should be a mod, but I don't know if he wants to be a mod. <laughs> He's always in our chats. Work. He's always in. He does a, but I, and I know, and he already does a lot of work. Like he does a huge amount of work. And Travis, if you're here still, man, just know that I am. I see you, my friend. I know what you do. I, I know the knowledge you kick out there, and I'm super appreciative, man. Because to be honest with you, um, I'm I'm like. I'm as I'm I'm stretched as thin as I can get in terms of like the time that I can spend on certain things. I gotta allocate like people that are following Garcia are seeing that I'm getting those episodes out. So I'm I'm working to to punch that thing out. Um so thank you, Travis, for everything you do. And again, thank you, Dr. Vonda. Uh Shiraz with an incredibly generous $50. Always give her mod, amazing member of the community, awesome in every She's single way. She's paying us thank to work so for much. us. Yeah, basically, what are you, uh, what you were fighting for is precisely what made me cry when I hear our national anthem. Hear, hear, no kidding. I mean, like, it's, it's our entire thing. It's what our entire country is about. Like, people just, it, it gets, it gets lost in the minutia. It gets lost in the fight. It gets lost in the emotion of cases. And it's like, like I'm not going to allow it to happen. I have to keep reminding people. And, and and like I've made like if you go into other groups, people hate me. <laughs> it's like Allison was saying. It's like like I could have taken the easy path. I could have been the guy. I could have you know. It's like he's I very say, personable. Like, he could have gotten people to love him. Oh, I could have been. I could have been. I could have taken the easy road here. Instead, I, 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 you know, I chose the path less traveled, you know, and I, I think we bring value, you know, and like I said, I've got thick skin, so, you know, I can take the abuse or I just ignore it, <laughs> one of the two, you know, so, but thank you so much for that, uh, Shiraz, I beyond appreciate it. Dr. Vonda coming back again, um, $5 holla, I don't know what part of the RA case, but you and I No, I know you aren't have. part. I know oh, you right. Are. We read this earlier. We read this earlier. But oh, okay. But you and Allie are the closest we have to helping RA. What else can we do? I feel so helpless. I mean, just keep trying to, you know, be a part of, of making people aware of people's and rights. Like, I mean, guilty. that that's like, that's all we can do. That's all we can do. Obviously, you know, if you want to help support the defense in terms of getting experts, there's that, I think they're, you know, they're, they're probably, you know, like until they tell us they need more, I think not us as in Bob I and mean, I, us as in the public by requesting more, <laughs> um, you know, I think everybody's doing what they can or yeah. what they could. Uh, $10 from Kasha. Uh, amazing. Amazing. Um, the profession of defense attorneys as a whole has their eyes on this case. Yes, they do has offered their services filed into the case. That means something is wrong, period. Yes. God bless. Here, here. Exactly. That's 100%. All the things that mean I agree completely with that statement. Thank you for your support in all ways that you give it. I really appreciate it. I, I hope you know that. Uh, Nav the EO, man, the always giver, the infamous Nav the EO. Like if I were to dig into anything, it would be to figure out who Nav the EO is, the mysterious Nav the EO, who like consistently gives away 50 Defense Diary podcast memberships. I cannot tell like I, I know not if you're man or woman, but to me it, and matters it doesn't matter. Not. I, right. It doesn't matter at all. Like right. I, I just I wish there was a way I could discern who they were so I could like thank them personally. I feel like it's so generic, but mm -hmm. Thank you so much for your consistent, incredible support. It's amazing. And we're so thankful to you. Um, Lily B, member for four months. Um, what's that little thing, babe? Like the thank what you. What is that thing? I think, I think it's oh, the thank you that, hands. Oh, it's a hug. It's a hugs. Aw, oh. family hugs for y'all, Bob and Allie. Thank you for everything you do. Thank you, Lily B, for being a part of the mem you know, the membership and, and also more importantly, part of the fam. Dr. Vonda K, wow. You're burning a hole in your wallet tonight. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. $20 holla. I appreciate you both so much. You are first and foremost trustworthy, intelligent, and excellent host and tolerant of pest, Mike. You are not a, a pest, anything but. Uh, believe right. me when I say that. Um, 
like I, I know of some pests and you ain't it. Thank you so much, Dr. Vonda. I, I am so appreciative of you being in this community. Always. We're, we're all lucky to have you here. Believe me when I say that. Thank you. Now the EO, you're both Go amazing. Thanks for the again. facts, the rants, and everything in between. Thank you, Nav. Thank you so Appreciate much for that, that consistent report. And, and I'm so glad that you've been a member for five months. You are an OG, my friend. Melissa, 199, Bob drops the mic. Oh, it does. Boop. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Appreciate Thanks. that. Dr. Vonda, back again. $2 holla. You don't <laughs> have to read all my chats a lot. Okay. Yes, I do. <laughs> Yes, I do. That's part of the deal. Uh, Angela Mod, uh, we love you guys to death. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Thank you for being a mod. Thank you for being just a, a trusted member of the family. We adore you. Thank you so much. Julio Suave, uh, Defense Attorneys Unite, appreciate you. Thank you for being a member for two months. We're so glad that you're here. Um, Angela, again, oh, $5. I Our rights are... I'm oh, sorry. I was going to say, because I'm scrolling down, that it was probably one of our mods that highlighted C. Cheney's question because it was just a, a question. But we're about to get to it, so it's it's fine. Oh, I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm not skipping anything. Uh, our rights are being taken away little by little. Soon we won't have any, especially if we lose people like you guys. Thank you, guys. Truly appreciate it. Aww. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for getting it. <laughs> Thank you for understanding. I it's it, it really helps when we know that people understand what we're trying to do here. Um, thank you for your support. Thank you for that $5 holla. Uh, see, Chini, question, how long does an appeal actually take to get through? Typically Allie, two to three years. Right, like from trials ended, briefing, you know, waiting, and then like ruling, you know, probably. And that's for the direct hand. appeal. Yeah, for your direct appeal, right? Yeah, for that's the appellate first. process, yeah. it could take fifteen years. years longer. It depends. 20. If you're talking about post conviction relief act stuff, it's be forever. Right, QB designs even... ten dollar holla because hate is gonna hate. Here's another one. Appreciate you. <laughs> hate you. is gonna hate. You ain't never lied. You ain't never lied, QB. Thank you so much for that support. Just Shelby, five dollar holla donating just so you have to read and annoy the haters. <laughs> Aw, family hugs. Truth, girl. Truth. <laughs> Appreciate the support. Uh, and then last but not least, our adorable always giver, aka radar. Bob and Allie, give me a shout if you need a place to stay, uh, the entire three week trial or pick and choose dates. Thank you so much for that wonderful offer. Uh I've had several offers from incredibly generous people that have places that sound like they could put me up. So, um, like I, like, I can't even tell you how much I appreciate that. It's like, if I have to, and Gull's talking about going, you know, six days a week, Al, I don't know if you know that. Did you know that she was talking about what? going Monday I have through Saturday? Never, ever, ever heard of such a thing. Well, what I'm trying to tell you is that, like, I might be away from my family for like six days a week for three weeks. I'm not excited about that. I am. I mean, not has she that. actually said that on the? Oh yeah, on the she, that that's it. That's what she's doing. Like that is in stone. So thank you for that offer, uh, Radar. And and I don't know, um, AKA Radar. I don't know. Have you hit me up on DMs? Because, like, I, I may not be putting um, screen names together with uh, real names. Like, I'm not good at that. <laughs> not my strength. So hit me up on DMs on Twitter and Facebook on the Messenger um, and let me know what's up. And let me know if you're one of the people. Uh, Who's Greg Jane Nugent. Meum? Who's Greg? Who is Jane Meum? Could there be a connection? I don't know who Jane Meham is. Greg, who is that? Somebody Type it knows. to us. Like I, I don't know who the hell Jane Meham is. I don't know. I haven't heard that name. Jolene, always give her twenty dollar holla. She slips in at the last minute, which she is uh, known to do. She she often sneaks in and gives a little love right at the end. So we appreciate that twenty dollar holla. We really, really do. Jen, love you, members, and chat. 
All right. So that's it, y'all. Um, to my mods, thank you, Greg, for that two dollar holla. Greg snuck in and gave another two bucks too. Um, so that's it, y'all. We will be back sooner than uh, sooner rather than later. Uh, we will be going through, like I said, the state's filing and the defense's response to that filing. And like I said, I'm trying to line it up so that I have a geo uh, fencing expert on with us. So hopefully he can explain to me what the hell is what, because I, like, I have to be honest, I was reading through the state's thing and I'm like, I don't know what any of this means other than they're poo pooing it. You know, like I, I had no way to know if it was legitimate or not legitimate because I, I, I don't understand the technology. So I need somebody way smarter than I am in that field to explain it to me. So that that's what I'm hoping to do with that. Um, and then my mods, our mods, we love you guys. We are so very thankful to you for all of your hard work. And you guys know who you are. Um, you're here night in, night out. You're here on our lives. You guys are just amazing. I'm so, I can't even tell you how thankful I am that you guys are out there uh, and that you have our backs and for all the work that you guys do because you guys are beyond amazing. So I hope you're feeling this love coming through this screen because um it is absolute gospel i just adore you guys to the moon and back to the moon and back so all right y'all thank you all for hanging thanks for guys two and two and a half hours um hope we brought you some decent content and uh because remember without you i'll just be an old man talking about a lot of cases boop talk to you next time Oh